Good morning, early good morning for you on the west coast of the US um, and good afternoon to colleagues um, in Africa and elsewhere. My name is Walmart James and I am a senior research scholar at Columbia University and uh, the host of today's meeting. So to start it with, uh, to welcome you to what is known as the History and Future of Planetary Threats seminar series that is hosted by the Institute for Social and Economic Research and Policy at Columbia University. The inaugural seminar was given by Dr. Ernie Monitz of the Nuclear Threat Initiative on Nuclear Security Today. The second seminar was given by Farid Zakaria on his new book. It's now not so new anymore, but this is his book, 10 Lessons for a Post-Pandemic World. A month ago, we partnered with a program in vaccine education at the Vagilis College of Physicians and Surgeons in the Global Symposium on Vaccine Development. Today, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the colloquium on crisis communications and vaccine uptake in fragile African settings, which we do consider to be a global risk, not just a regional risk. Last week, the Resolve to Save Lives released statistics indicating the low willingness of African citizens and others across the globe, it's a global problem, to take vaccines when they arrive. 35% of Tunisian citizens say that they're willing to take um, the vaccine when it arrives, 59% in Kenya, 61% in South Africa. These are all alarming figures. In two weeks time, uh, we will have the fourth seminar discussing President Biden's plan for an advanced warning system for pandemic and epidemic outbreaks. I'd like to acknowledge our partners, frontline nurses uh, from the Center for the Study of Social Difference, the School of Nursing, the program uh, in vaccine education at Columbia's Medical School, the Earth Institute, uh, the Columbia Global Centers uh, represented here today by Marugi Durango, and um, as well as um, Yusuf Sharif. Um, and uh, last but not least, the Academy of Political Science, which will generously publish today's proceedings. I'd like to thank my collaborators, Victoria Rosner and Jennifer Dorn, uh, and for their superb assistance, Harlow Wang and Jennifer Ward at Columbia. There is a strike ongoing at Columbia, colleagues. A senior student wrote to say that the union has been fighting for four years for the first contract, we are currently on strike for a living wage. We are also asking for real recourse for discrimination and adequate health care. We would like to recognize that these are real issues in need of a resolution. If I can now turn to Harlow Wang just to review the Zoom etiquette for this morning. Over to you, Harlow. Thank you, Dr. James. Um, I'd like to echo welcome to everybody. And I would like to invite the audience members, uh, we do invite your participation via questions during this uh, event. We have three Q&A sections for the panels during our event today. You can submit questions in the Q&A function. There's a Q&A button at the bottom right of your screen. Um, if you hit the Q&A button, you can type questions in. You can also see questions asked by other attendees and upvote them if you would like to see that question answered. And our moderators will do their best to get through um, all of the interesting questions I'm sure you have. Back to you, Dr. James. Thank you very much, Harlow. If I can now introduce to you Dr. Marugi Durango, who leads the Columbia Global Centers in Nairobi and spearheads there the education, research, and public program programming activities uh, while liaising with the academic divisions, the professional schools, and the administrative units at Columbia University, as well as both regional and local partners. Over to you, Amarugi. Um. Uh, thank you very much, Wilmot. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for today's event. As uh, Wilmot has said, my name is Marugi Dirango, and I am the director of Columbia Global Center in Nairobi. CGC Nairobi is a part of Columbia University's global network of centers aiming to create research and scholarship opportunities. In addition to the Nairobi Center, Columbia University has established centers in Amman, Beijing, Istanbul, Mumbai, 
Paris, Rio, Santiago, and Tunis. My colleague from Tunis will be speaking to you shortly. The Nairobi Center and all the other centers serve as regional hubs for research and collaboration as part of Columbia University's strategy to achieve a global presence. Uh, our center here in Nairobi links the Eastern and Southern African region to Colombia's scientific rigor, technological innovation and academic leadership. We are delighted and honored to be associated with this critical and very timely discussion, considering that we're experiencing a potent third wave of the COVID-19 pandemic in some countries in our region, including Kenya. Vaccine rollout has commenced, but the uptake, as Wilmot has said, has been slow in some instances, with a lot of mis misinformation driving some vaccine hesitancy in the population. I look forward to an enlightening discussion on how stakeholders can communicate better to address some of these challenges. I now welcome my colleague Youssef Sharif, the Tunis Center Director, to welcome you. Welcome, Youssef. Thank you very much, Murugi. Thank you, Professor James. Good morning, good afternoon. Um, and uh, Murugi presented the work of the Global Centers. I will just add that at the Global Center Tunis, we uh, work on the Western and the Northern part of Africa with plenty of programs, including on programs on public health and uh, medicine, especially since the outbreak of COVID-19. Uh, but I will here briefly introduce a political setting that in which we are evolving now. And um, we have four major problems, I think, facing vaccine distribution in the African continent. One is the political instability that we see in Libya, most of the Sahel and the Horn regions. Two, economic difficulties that make buying the vaccine quite difficult. Three, the weak infrastructure of the health sector which makes the distribution of the vaccine difficult. And four, perhaps as importantly, or more importantly, especially for the topic that we're discussing today, the spread of disinformation and misconceptions about the virus and the vaccines. And um, Dr. Wilmot, but also Dr. Murugi mentioned a few points related to this. In fact, the pandemic is not taken, taken very seriously by important segments of the population across the globe, not just in Africa. But it takes other dimensions in our continent where elite groups, including ministers, heads of state, and other public figures issued statements that are skeptical um, about the pandemic and the vaccine process. The belief that the virus and the vaccine are conspiracies is um, quite widespread. From the northernmost point of Africa, where I am now, to its southernmost cape. And the end result of all this is a difficulty to make people accept to take the right precautions and a difficulty to vaccinate them. And again, um, uh, um, Dr. Wilmot mentioned, uh, Dr. James mentioned a few statistics and, um, and percentages of people who are um, not willing to take the vaccine actually. And this is something we hear whenever we talk to people in, in the street um, and really up to doctors and people who should be very well informed. So he, hence the importance of the topics that we will discuss today. And um, we are very honored to be part of this symposium and I give you the, the floor, Dr. James. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to, to Yusuf Cherif, uh, who is a political analyst specializing in North African affairs and has just introduced the topic for today's discussion in a really powerful way. So thank you very much uh, to you. If I can now introduce you to Natalia Kanem. Um, Natalia Kanem is the United Nations Under Secretary General and Executive Director of the United Nations Populations Fund, uh, focusing on um, um, sexual and reproductive health as an agency of the UN. She is, I'm uh, happy to say, a Columbia University um, a graduate. Um, um, she has an MD uh, and she has more than 30 years of strategic leadership in the field of preventive medicine, public and reproductive health, social justice and philanthropy. I had the great uh, pleasure of working with uh, Natalia uh, at the Ford Foundation, where I served as a trustee for 12 years. 
and she was a fabulous leader and I'm delighted that she's joining us today. Uh, over to you, Natalia. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Wilma James for the introduction and my greetings and thanks to the conveners. Distinguished participants, partners, colleagues, friends, as the world continues to deal with the devastating impact of the novel coronavirus pandemic, we can all agree that today's conversation on crisis communications and vaccine uptake in fragile African settings is crucial at a moment when potentially millions of lives are at stake. Ensuring fair, equitable, and efficient distribution of vaccines is a critical and timely challenge that the world can solve and cannot afford to delay. It is in that spirit that I join you today to share the unique experience of UNFPA, the United Nations Sexual and Reproductive Health Agency, in risk communication and engaging marginalized communities during public health emergencies. For over 50 years now, UNFPA has operated in some of the most complex and challenging settings, including humanitarian settings, delivering sexual and reproductive health and protection services amidst conflict, amidst natural disasters, and during disease outbreaks like now. Providing reliable and effective communication during any emergency is never simple, but this COVID-19 pandemic is presenting unique challenges. Now, the ripple effect of the pandemic imposed a new level of suffering and hardship across the uh, world's already vulnerable populations, uh, especially women and girls, many of whom were already facing significant barriers to public health information and services anyway. And now movement restrictions and social distancing measures require new ways of communicating, even in remote areas. There, many women and girls live off the grid. They may not have electricity or internet. They may be in an island nation. They may be up the mountain or down in the valley. And it is often very difficult for them to reach their service delivery points without walking for inordinate amounts of time. So the simple measures uh, that WHO has recommended, frequent hand washing, physical distancing, other types of mitigation measures can be much more difficult or even impossible for them to adhere to. Throughout the pandemic, UNFPA has helped to amplify COVID-19 prevention measures and to boost the dissemination of accurate information about the virus to women, to girls, We've trusted the young people we serve to carry correct information. And this is alongside efforts to keep people informed about their rights, including their sexual and reproductive health and rights. So through our long history of partnering with governments, with civil society, with women's groups, academia, and especially youth networks, we are now adding faith-based alliances more and more, as well as with traditional systems with authority over the lives of the women and girls, especially that 10-year-old girl who we have to inspire, who we have to reach. Along with other UN agencies, we serve as an organization with eyes and ears and feet on the ground uh, in over 150 locations. We're uniquely positioned in these countries to provide reliable, trusted information, the midwives, the nurses that UNFPA contracts. These are trusted, reliable providers of information and support. I'd like to uh, note some of the experiences that we've been able to draw on from our past uh, dealing with disease outbreaks. At the outset of COVID-19, our regional office in West Africa commissioned a review of the response to major epidemics since 2003, including SARS, HIV, of course, which preceded this date, but which has a rich store of information about activism and its role in 
uh, uh, preventing uh, propagation of infection. We reviewed the Ebola virus experience, Zika, and MERS. And here are the three takeaways that I would like you to know. One is consistency, consistent messaging and community engagement, essential to help women and their families seek early advice to make timely decisions regarding their own health, regarding maternal and newborn health. And in general, because of the nurses and midwives, the perception that maternity wards are safe places to learn and to engage. Second, health promotion campaigns. These are critical in informing communities on how to access their health services, their sexual and reproductive health services, including contraception. During a time of pandemia, women who have a choice typically choose not to become pregnant. We've seen this in uh, the developed countries. In contrast, in developing countries, we're actually seeing uh, a, a, a baby boom, including among teens, among teenagers, who are not able to exercise their uh, uh, control over their fertility in a way that they would wish. Now, my third takeaway is partnership and collaboration. Strong collaboration with existing formal and informal social networks. And this would include giving tangible support to women's groups, community groups, and civil society organizations who play an outsized role on the front lines of tackling spikes in gender-based violence, which have accompanied this pandemic. And I'm also speaking of humanitarian circumstances as well. We know that during this pandemic, misinformation coupled with a lack of trust are undermining the uptake of life-saving tools, services, and information. The Secretary General of the United Nations has spoken about this misinformation and disinformation, as has Dr. Tedros of WHO, and as has, w and as has UNFPA. In our survey conducted in East and Southern Africa with almost 200 young people, they confirmed to us a fear of accessing health services due to COVID-19. And these fears will likely linger and have long-term repercussions on their health and well-being. It's an empowered community that can help tackle misinformation and to build that trust. And this is especially true for women. Women are often in a very good position to relay accurate information through their networks. And it's especially the case for local women's groups who are key social mobilizers. So to engage communities and to effectively involve them in risk communication efforts, this must be a critical part to our response to COVID-19 in Africa and beyond. Understanding the lived reality during the pandemic and keeping communication channels open during a time of physical distancing, particularly for those who are at greatest risk of being left behind. And to give a couple of examples, persons with disabilities who are too often overlooked in our communications. In Ghana, UNFPA has engaged private sector support for a state school for the deaf, providing hundreds of girls with specially modified dignity kits, which contain along with menstruation and hygiene supplies, face masks, as well as age appropriate information, education and communication materials relating to COVID-19 and also discussing adolescent sexual and reproductive health. Another example is sex workers. Apart from their danger of contracting and spreading the virus as they are severely affected by movement restrictions put in place to control the spread of COVID-19, they suffer stigma, loss of income, and a heightened risk of gender-based violence. In Kenya, along the trucking corridor serving Uganda, Rwanda, the Democratic Republic of Congo and Burundi, UNFPA runs drop-in centers. These are places where COVID-19 prevention messages 
are disseminated among sex workers and drivers. Our on-site telecounseling is offered for health consultations and treatment support in local language, language that people can understand. Face masks, hand sanitizers, et cetera, are given out alongside condoms and the center's personnel are also there to provide services for the clinical management of rape. Indeed, who is conveying the message matters as much as the message itself. In previous crises, an uptake of risk prevention recommendations was highest when reliable intermediaries were the ones delivering the messages. During the Ebola outbreak, UNFPA worked with communities in the Democratic Republic of Congo to raise awareness of infection prevention and control practices using trusted messengers to reach people at home, in churches, and in markets with essential information for, for preventing and controlling uh, Ebola in that case. And in South Sudan, we've been active to use community dialogues. This is a great way to reach people during COVID-19, socially distance is appropriate, focusing on community influencers, including religious leaders, teachers, artists, young people, who use the power of radio as well, which has a wide reach along with house to house mobilization where that's possible. And we've supported various multimedia campaigns and efforts, some led by our young, uh, our cadre of young innovators to raise pandemic awareness among young people, but also to support young people in this time of need. It's especially important now, given their limited social interaction through school, through uh, typical leisure and recreation settings in communities that have been curtailed. So these programs are helping young people to stay connected, to stay interested, and to give them an avenue to express COVID-related anxieties, the mental health consequences of this pandemic, and their concerns about that. In Namibia, young people are helping their peers through a youth outreach program where they share information about COVID pre prevention, and they're mobilizing to undertake rapid on-the-spot assessment of the impact of COVID on young people while they provide uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights information and condoms and referrals to services. Now, uh, I'll mention that amid school closures, adolescent girls and young women have been at greater risk of gender-based violence, of unintended pregnancies, and of harmful practices such as child marriage and female genital mutilation still prevalent on the continent. In Sierra Leone, UNFPA supports a radio program that airs up to five days a week, and it aims to reach both in and out of school adolescents with empowerment messages. To increase access to this program, UNFPA has distributed more than a thousand radios to households with vulnerable adolescent girls. And we continue to support research. The Population Fund still is entrusted with census and we generate information and insights into how risk communication and community engagement activities can be better framed, better packaged and better delivered. All of this can enhance our COVID-19 pandemic response. Understanding communities and adapting to reflect their current insights. That's how the story is going to change. And that story is different in every community. There's not a one size fits all approach that can work. At the heart of the matter is this. During these challenging times for ourselves and for those we serve, certainly for us as United Nations representing a beacon of hope in neutrality and impartiality and in a human rights-based approach. It's our insistence on upholding health systems, of upholding the principles of dialogue for justice and peace that spell the difference. So for all of us uh, across the United Nations system as international civil servants, and really I think as broadly as citizens of this planet, everyone, 
must ensure that we communicate clearly to the rights holder herself, her inalienable possession of such rights, which are indivisible, including her right to bodily autonomy and sexual and reproductive health and rights, as expressed in the Sustainable Development Goals unanimously adopted by United Nations member states. Furthermore, she as a rights holder must be aware that she is at liberty to exercise such rights without fear of coercion or violence and without discrimination due to racism, sexism, ableism, or any other form of abrogation to her right to health, to full gender equality as well. So indeed, millions of lives hang in the balance at a time of rampant coronavirus spread if the population of Africa is not urgently availed of vaccines in sufficient quantity, or if disinformation and big lies lead to vaccine avoidance and rejection, as we're discussing today. This is true in Africa, and it's true too elsewhere, as we note that Afrodescendiente communities and indigenous people, indigenous peoples are the hardest hit by the death toll of this pandemic. So dear friends, the big takeaway from this global pandemic is that the world is intimately connected and none of us is safe until all of us are safe, until vaccines are widely available and equally distributed. Our behavior remains the most powerful weapon to stop the spread of the virus. And they say that if you close your eyes to facts, you must learn through accidents. While the vaccine represents humanity's best hope to end this global public health emergency, the vaccine is also arriving at a time when the misinformation and the mistrust have probably never been greater. And as long-standing inequalities have been uprooted and opened for all to see. So a successful public health response to break the chains of transmission to mitigate the impacts of the most on the most vulnerable, including women and girls, will require close communication and engagement on the ground with communities, leading to trust in data and evidence. Pandemic or not, UNFPA will continue to champion the safety and the dignity of vulnerable groups. We will support communities by forging alliances, by nurturing relationships, by building that trust and using facts and evidence-based approaches as the antidote to fear. When we invest in the health and well-being of communities, that's building the resilience that we will need to cope with this crisis and future ones and to ensure a healthier world for all. Thank you. So thank you very much to, uh, to Dr. Kanem to Natalia for taking us through so meticulously and so systematically uh, through the special vulnerabilities uh, that women and girls and uh, populations overall experience and highlighting and drawing our attention to just the nexus of social relationships that they actually manage um, and play a very powerful, if unacknowledged, leadership role. And it's hard, as she described, um, that the economic impacts of the pandemic has been severe and it's actually been quite brutal in many parts of Africa and elsewhere. Um, the level of suspicion and conspiracies that pandemics always generate, but it's been amplified by leaders who do not um, um, send consistent science-based messages. Uh, and it was a very welcome review uh, and your insistence on the urgency of us tackling the question of both vaccine acquisition and vaccine rollout together with a sensible approach to public health is greatly appreciated. Let me also say, um, Natalia, that uh, we really admire and support your leadership in the agency, you and agency that you run. Um, it's a work of great courage. Um, you did your first mission um, uh, to Syria and to 
South Sudan, I think. Um, and that and that takes um, that takes both leadership and courage. And so, thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank um, you. Very and much. so, if I can, if I can, thank you very much for your contribution today, thank for laying you. the framework for our for our session. So, colleagues, we are now going into our panel discussion, uh, and the panel discussion um, will reflect on uh, the importance of human agency of the fact that we are uh, communities made up of individuals who act and we have the power to act as individuals and then we have responsibilities to act. And uh, we would like to approach the first panel discussion from the point of view of in, in individual participation in dealing with the pandemic as individual health citizens in the world and people who have the agency to act. And we need to acknowledge that um, that agency in health decision making. Um, and the question is, how do we build communica a communications infrastructure uh, from the local level and up uh, rather than uh, top down? Clearly, it's both. Uh, communication requires a top down approach combined with a bottom up approach. And we recognize that those two interact. Our first speaker uh, on this panel. Uh, will be Donda Hansen. Uh, you will see in our chat function that we give uh, speaker bios in some detail. So let me just briefly introduce uh, Dr. Hansen by saying that she is the Associate Director for Communications at the uh, Center for Global Health uh, at the U United States Center for Disease Control based in Atlanta. She has 25 years um, of communications experience she was involved in the West Africa Ebola response in the DRC and in other parts of the world when it comes to uh, risk communication. We've asked her to speak on um, learning uh, vaccine related lessons from the Ebola virus disease outbreak in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which are, as you will remember, um, compared to the West African outbreak uh, in the DRC, a vaccine was available and, the, uh, and those vaccines were distributed and there were very valuable lessons to be learned uh, from that experience. Uh, so over to you, Dr. Hansen. Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, um, wherever you may be in the world. Um, I just want to uh, let you all know that today I'm gonna talk specifically about um, my experience uh, and what I observed while I was deployed to the Democratic Republic of Congo for the Ebola outbreak in the fall of 2019. Uh, so there is a, a map on the on the screen at this point. And at that time, it was the uh, this is the area where um, the headquarters of the response was based in Goma. And the uh, highlighted areas show where the the outbreak was at that time. So uh, that is the context for, for what I'm going to talk about um, and some background. Uh, so in August of 2018, uh, the, the outbreak began in the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, and this was spreading across the eastern health zones that you see on the map. This was a border region where thousands of people um, crossed every day into the neighboring countries. Um, the hotel where I stayed at was right at the border, so we could see that firsthand. Uh, in September of 28, uh, 2018, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, we began deployments to the area to support the Ministry of Health. And then uh, in July of 2019, the World Health Organization declared a public health emergency of international concern. So when I arrived in Goma in September of 2019, the outbreak had been going on for a year. It had affected 29 health zones and across um, three provinces at that point. Uh, there were around 3,000 cases and 2,000 deaths. And this is about the time that the second vaccine was introduced into the DRC. So a bit more about the environment. Um, the res response um, was hindered by unpredictable insecurity in the Ebola affected areas. There was community reticence and there was ongoing armed group activity. In addition, there was concern that transmission would spill, spill over into the neighboring countries, including Burundi, Uganda, Rwanda, and South Sudan. Uh, the World Health Organization and the government of DRC, um, Ministry of Health, were leading the response and overseeing the 
development of a strategic response plan. And this plan drew on key tools and strategies and experience from the West Africa Ebola response, including broad vaccination and therapeutic clinical trials. And these had evolved since the West Africa response. Um, as I said, the response was based in Goma, and I worked very closely there with the Communication Commission, which led the campaign around the, the vaccine. Um, rumors and misunderstanding was rampant. Many were concerned that Ebola, the Ebola response was a business. Um, there were feelings that money should be focused on security instead of the response. There was confusion on who was eligible for vaccines. There was confusion on vaccination procedures and the efficacy and safety of the vaccine. A Noveta survey that was conducted on vaccines and treatment centers, and it was conducted late, early, late August, early September in the Butembo Katwa region. Um, about 28% of the population had, been, had received the vaccine, 72% had not. And so some of the reasons um, cited for not getting the vaccine, um, they didn't know if the vaccine was good or not. Um, they thought there were too many secondary side effects. Um, people who, another reason was people who got the vaccine are not cured. Um, they felt that the ETU, the Ebola treatment unit, uh, was the only one that could cure you. There were political reasons as well. Um, there was a fear that uh, the, the vaccine was there to kill certain ethnic groups. Um, there was fear that the vaccine contained Ebola um, and that people start dying when the vaccine arrives to an area that the vaccinated were the first to die. So um, people were concerned really about deaths that they felt they perceived as being associated with the vaccine, uh, that it passes Ebola, it's used to, to kill people and the vaccine results in death. There was also widespread belief that there were two vaccines and the one that was being given to the community was not effective. There was fear that the second vaccine would be deployed in the DRC as a way for response teams to continue to profit from the people of North Kivu. And during all of this confusion uh, over the second vaccine, it allowed for opportunities of the sale of fake vaccines. There were rumors circulating in a uh, Benny uh, WhatsApp channel that claimed that um, someone was peddling a Congolese made vaccine. And then with security issues really dominating the local media channels, um, little information was being shared about the timeline of the introduction uh, of that second vaccine. So there was a lot of uncertainty going on. Some of the, the strategies um, that we used, that were used at the time, um, of course, the vaccine was being deployed using a ring vaccination strategy that was vaccinating the contacts and the contacts of, of contacts to prevent the spread of uh, the disease by social networks. This is the strategy that was used um, in Guinea and the West Africa Ebola outbreak, and it's the same strategy that was used to eradicate smallpox. Um, in this case, the contacts, um, the vaccine was offered to the contacts and contacts of contacts of patients um, with confirmed Ebola. Healthcare workers and frontline workers um, also uh, working in the affected areas received the vaccine. Uh, and then those that were in areas that were at risk of spread of the outbreak were also. And then finally, um, if there was an affected uh, geographic area where security concerns made it unfeasible to do contact tracing, then, then all people living in that ge geographic area, maybe a village, um, would have received the vaccine. So CDC's objective was to support the, the Ministry of Health there in the DRC and, and the World Health Organization's vaccine efforts. Um, so it's difficult to communicate about uncertainty. Um, in that area, generally the surveys were showing that most of the people were getting their news from the radio. I mean, upwards of 80%. Uh, it varies um, on region, but it was a pretty good chunk. Um, and then followed by local media um, officials or local leaders. And then they, they received information from community members and then WhatsApp. That was a huge channel where people were getting uh, information and a lot of that information was, was not accurate. Getting information um, out to outlying areas was an issue. 
Um, we worked with the uh, Communication Commission to publish a weekly summary, and it was called the Etat de Lieu. This was distributed with information from headquarters and the response out to the, the local areas um, through the subcommissions. Um, this was an attempt to make sure that they were getting on a week updates that was um, being shared uh, at the response headquarters. Community feedback was key. Surveys were con conducted by various partners over the course of the outbreak. Uh, one example was a unique partnership between the Red Cross and CDC. Red Cross community health workers were on the front lines of the response. They were regularly engaging with the community and CDC experts were able to analyze data. So together they developed a form that the Red Cross volunteers um, could take with them into the field when they were engaging with the community and they could record um, consistently uh, because they all had the same form information uh, by categories. And then those forms were returned to CDC and CDC would code that data and they provided weekly response um, summaries to the response of trends and themes of what those rumors are, what they were hearing beliefs, uh, and this was shared across the response. Because of some of the um, feedback that was, was um, received, uh, the international community developed a principles of community engagement. Uh, and this was vetted by almost all of the partners working in the area. And this was intended to guide the way international community engaged with local communities, because this was so key. Um, we wanted to make sure that uh, the international community was, was engaging uh, in a respectful way that was accepted by communities. Another area was to um, incorporate risk communication principles in the training that the other technical areas were training. For example, uh, the infection prevention control uh, pillar, they would incorporate risk communication uh, principles into the training that they were giving. And so did the contact tracing and the vaccine trains. This way, everybody understood uh, how to communicate while they were uh, engaging with communities. And then there were finally, not finally, but there was a an attempt to, um, we wanted to make sure that the community health workers, the frontline workers, everyone who was out there engaging with the community on a daily basis was educated and really understood the vaccines so that they could respond to the questions and concerns that they were getting. So there was a series of workshops that was designed just to educate those, those vaccinators, uh, starting with the heart spots and then uh, moving on to other health zones. Uh, the overall objective is to you know, understand the importance of communication throughout the vaccination process and to be able to communicate effectively and sensitively with those vaccination candidates in order to increase their confidence and uh, the vaccination rates among those at higher risk. So some of the lessons um, that we learned from this, um, you know, first of all, the, the vaccine, vaccine was, was deployed very, very quickly. Uh, we did not have that in, in West Africa, uh, but many of those lessons learned from West Africa were used in DRC. And within a week of the outbreak in August of 2018, the uh, experimental vaccine was deployed. Um, as I said, community engagement was key. There were over 30 partners. Um, you know, this is in September of, of 2019, over 30 partners and, and 53 local associations, some of them faith-based, um, women, youth, taxi drivers, they were supporting community engagement. Uh, Ebola messages were, you know, on 85 radio stations and outbreak hotspots. And it's estimated that, you know, 16.8 million people were, were receiving that, that information. A one-size-fits-all approach uh, to community engagement is not effective. Um, people ask for responders who were local, familiar, and spoke local languages. Speaking of languages, um, most of the products produced at the headquarters were produced in Swahili and French, um, and that, that wasn't sufficient. Uh, many of the local languages, um, they, they weren't being addressed. So that was a, that was a key piece that needed, um, I think that as the response continued, there was an attempt to really, really reach people in the language that they understood. We learned that citizens were receiving, vac citizens that received vaccine information from community bulletins, you know, signs, posters, flyers that are in their area, and local me medical professionals 
and it, but this is not including traditional healers. Um, it increased the probability of accurate information dissemination. So when they were able to get that information uh, close with trusted leaders that were local, um, it tended to, to encourage accurate information. So social media, misinformation thrived on social media. Um, this a local WhatsApp channel um, claimed that treatment was the only cure for Ebola and actually encouraged citizens not to take the vaccine. This caused a lot of confusion between vaccines and treatment. Uh, and, and we also noted that when Ebola messaging declined from official sources in some regions, it picked up on social media and the misinformation increased. So if we're not providing accurate information, um, it's, it's a opportunity for misinformation to, to spread. So I will close. Um, the CDC has a motto from our crisis and emergency risk communication program. Uh, the right messages from the right people person at the right time can save lives. And that is the basis of, of risk communication. So I'll close with that. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hansen, uh, for taking us through the, the DRC vaccine uh, rollout uh, process. Um, and as everybody knows, the Democratic Republic of the Congo is a very difficult terrain in which to work. Uh, the state doesn't often have presence uh, in big parts of uh, the territory, uh, and therefore putting together its communication teams is a quite an elaborate exercise, and you took us through exactly what that meant. The three lessons that you uh, shared with us around the efficient uh, process of vaccine distribution uh, was an important one. Um, it's clear that with the current experience where vaccines are not available, the longer that's delayed, the more you have conspiracy theories floating around. So efficient, quick distribution and access is really quite key. Uh, your emphasis on community engagement uh, and the use of local languages and your final point about um, the fact that uh, it must be trusted individuals who communicate smart messages in the sense that they must reach the audience uh, is absolutely key to, uh, to a successful vaccine uh, risk communication. But thank you very much for that. Um, I'd like to turn to our next um, panelist who is Michael Gabrab. Um, Michael is going to speak to us on his experience working in pre and post crisis situations in South Sudan, Uganda, and Sierra Leone. He is an international development uh, specialist with deep African experience. His most recent um, project was to lead a USAID funded uh, project in food security in Malawi, but he is also, no, Andy is also a former veteran uh, of the Catholic uh, Relief uh, Services. So, uh, Michael, over to you. Um... Um, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for the introduction and uh, also inviting me to uh, participate on this important forum. Uh, what I'm going to uh, share uh, is not necessarily the experience or view of the organization that I work for, but my first, my personal reflection on. Uh, what went right and what didn't with regard to Ebola response in Sierra Leone primarily. And I have also made, uh, I will make some mention of Southern Sudan and Uganda with regard to the pre and post crisis situation in relation to Ebola. Uh, my presentation is not strictly focused on risk communication, but it highlights overall lessons learned with regard to improving uh, Ebola response in Sierra Leone. And, uh, Usually, you know, uh, in, in a pre-crisis situation, uh, there are three main areas that I, you know, we as NGOs, but primarily as a former Catholic Relief Services, we focused on with regard to health. Uh, one is on strengthening governance and operational structures. Second is capacity building of communities and different uh, local structures. And the third is more of strengthening the programmatic institutional and uh, financial domains of mainly social behavioral communication uh, related organizations of those that assist in, in, in our programs, health programs. 
So in Sierra Leone, uh, just to uh, highlight uh, importance of communication uh, with regard to coordination at a higher level, much as it's important to address communication from the bottom up, the way emergency response is set up is actually it's top bottom because uh, there has to be an authority that is going to determine uh, a status of emergency and usually in any country uh, that I have worked for so far, it's the president of the country to declare a state of emergency based on information that is provided by the respective ministry, whether it's Ministry of Agriculture or Ministry of Health. So in this case, uh, in Sierra Leone, uh, the Ebola outbreak started in Guinea in December, and uh, three months later, it uh, hit Liberia, I think in March. And Sierra Leone had at least a short window to prepare. Uh, unfortunately, that opportunity was missed. And when Ebola hit Sierra Leone, I think 24th of May, uh, there wasn't really much of preparation and there were parallel structures created. Ministry of Health and the Office of the President were trying to coordinate the response and information was being released from both, which created some sort of confusion then the WHO office became sort of the coordination center. And that I think largely added to the confusion at the beginning until something unprecedented, unprecedented had to be done because the scale and magnitude of the disaster was also unprecedented. And with support of the British army and the Sierra Leone army, uh, Catholic Relief Services together with other faith-based organizations, we were tasked to set up command and control centers throughout the country in each district, as well as in the national uh, office. So this was a different structure, never planned for before that, and uh, but it was necessary to set up something like that to bring a sense of order and good coordination to the confusion. And that delayed in somehow in the response, but I think many studies and research has come out after that with the setup of the command and control centers, the, the, the quality effectiveness of the response greatly improved. And this is in all the different subcommittees that were set up for the response, whether it is contact tracing, uh, testing, risk communication and social mobilization, all the different aspects of the response became effective and that worked. I will mention maybe later on why, why, what, what are the factors that made that work. In the case of Southern Sudan, uh, I was there, I think, uh, long ago before uh, Southern Sudan became a country. Uh, but from what I follow up with colleagues and, and what I have seen then, uh, everything was largely UN and NGO-led system because there wasn't really much of a system in Southern Sudan. Uh, in a way that uh, always helped in terms of preventing major breakouts, the quality of services were great, uh, but local ownership and uh, higher dependency on donor funding may be an issue there. Uh, in Uganda, I served in Uganda right after they had the first Ebola disaster in Northern Uganda, specifically Gulu. And uh, I think uh, Uganda learned from that incident effectively, and uh, there were uh, reflections and reviews of what happened, and that informed uh, the planning and preparedness for subsequent uh, breakouts. And since then, I think between 2002 and 2020, I could say, Uganda had about five incidents of Ebola, but not a breakout, just few cases, and then they would contain it uh, at its, you know, uh, budding stage, which means that they created a capacity, uh, they had the laboratory, they had the national uh, multidisciplinary national task force and a national rapid response teams, which carried out the assessment and guided, guided the response by establishing the risk levels, identifying where is the risk, uh, what is our capacity, and what needs to be done, including uh, 
uh, you know, consistent communication on, on the risk and uh, the public, I think, largely responded. With regard to the training or, or capacity building, um, in, in the case of Sierra Leone, we focused the, the training. So when we heard about the disaster in Guno, or the Ebola situation in Guinea, we, uh, as NGOs, we started uh, our preparations. So we had uh, usually the umbrella of uh, all the different NGOs, local and international. Uh, we shared some tools and uh, we capitalized on what we considered was our strength. And as a uh, staff of Catholic Relief Services at that point, uh, and understanding the context of Sierra Leone, uh, there was a big uh, opportunity to work with the religious leaders. So we contacted the Inter-Religious Council. Uh, this is the highest body of all different religious groups within the country. Uh, they were receptive to the idea that we can identify key focal persons from each of the different districts and bring them to Freetown for training, uh, which we did and involved communications, risk communication specialists as well. Uh, fortunately at the time, uh, one of the USAID flagship projects in uh, health communication was also operating in Sierra Leone. This is known as a H3, HC3 project, which was health uh, communication something. It was operating in 28 countries within Africa. So we brought uh, technical resource persons from there and did a training for uh, local organizations, media organizations, religious leaders, uh, and the training focused on two dimensions. One was on social accountability, so they can monitor on the services, the health services that, that would be provided uh, even during the Ebola situation, but also to mobilize their constituencies so that people can act uh, you know, as individual, as families, as communities. And uh, the religious leaders uh, made a commitment that they will be the voice for the vo voiceless. And, and that was very helpful. And in the case of Sierra Leone, they played a very effective role right from the beginning. Uh, for those who are familiar, uh, the issue of burial was a key uh, issue in, uh, in Sierra Leone. Um, safe burial, then recommendations and guidelines were released by WHO, but the religious leaders, uh, based on what they were gathering from the people and the local traditions, they advocated and uh, even had several discussions directly with the president of the country to uh, influence a change. So what used to be called as safe burial became safe and dignified burial processes. And we were involved in reviewing the guidelines and updating those guidelines so that they are done in a manner that somehow respects the, the local cultures as well uh, to avoid uh, you know, much bigger issues than the Ebola that they had. Uh, so these engagements did help. And uh, the involvement of the army, the Sierra Leone army, I think was a motivation to many of the citizens also to participate. We did some informal sort of interview with our own staff and partners to uh, understand their perception of why you know the army is involved in the response. And most of them said, you know, uh, usually the national army is involved to fight an enemy. So if Ebola is an enemy, then they are demonstrating that they are taking this seriously. And every citizen then have a responsibility to, to do their part. So I think that had a positive uh, impact on uh, motivating professionals at all levels to, to do their part in uh, combating the Ebola situation. Of course, at the time, we did not have uh, a vaccine. The vaccine was being developed as uh, the situation was unraveling. Uh, in the case of, I think, uh, Uganda, again, this is from what I, you know, gathered from colleagues and, and who were working there at the time. We were, we had a network and uh, still the strong surveillance system, I think, helped Uganda and uh, there wasn't really any case there. Uh, in as far as 
the uh, risk communication and social mobilization is concerned, uh, the command and control center uh, helped greatly because data from each of the different subgroups was coming to the same center and being analyzed on a daily basis and decisions were made based on that data. So informed decisions were being taken, including in adjusting the messages. The initial message that, that uh, was going out to the public, uh, which created a bit of confusion, is that it had a, a, a connotation in the local language that was in being interpreted by communities that Ebola does not have a cure. And uh, as a result, most of the local people turn to traditional healers because if the health workers are saying this disease does not have a cure, so why should we go to hospitals and, and health facilities? We should instead go to traditional healers. And that contributed to even aggravating the, the spread of the disease uh, because the traditional healers, they, they were not observing the the necessary sanitation, you know, uh, recommendations. Uh, so again, many of the traditional leaders died as a result, um, and, and uh, many people. But these messages were being reviewed and adjusted as the uh, response was being implemented, simply because there was a mechanism to get feedback, review, and make adjustments on, on the communication. Yeah. Uh, but more importantly, the, com the command and control center help in uh, ensuring consistent communication. Um, with regard to uh, so, the strengthening so the Michael, programmatic... Michael, Hello? yeah, if you if you if you uh, if you could wrap up, please. Okay, sure. All right, let me then skip these slides. Uh, I would just say. All right, uh, the, uh, again, the, the, there are serious concerns at the moment with regard to vaccine uptake. And uh, what I, I see is there is a counterproductive uh, information war on social media that is really impacting on uh, people, which is then leading to resistance. So one of the strategies I think to, uh, to counter react this would involve working with, with artists and uh, some celebrities and people who have large followers on social media so that they can, they can send uh, the right communication, which then would encourage the, the pickup of uh, the, so, all the other vaccines. Involving NGOs so, and CSOs in risk communication and social behavioral change communication is critical and their knowledge of the grassroots structure and local context will enable them to think more creatively on how to design and implement appropriate risk communication strategies to increase uptake of vaccines. So, Michael, that's a, that's, a, that's a really good, if, um, I mean, that's a really good um, segue into our discussion um, uh, around the importance of uh, dealing with NGOs. Um, um, so, Sorry, can I finish one point? To just, yeah, just one point, that's great. All right, okay, sorry for, yeah, for taking more time. Yeah, coordinating uh, across interagency is uh, notoriously difficult all the time. And, uh, but as I mentioned, the command control center approach in Sierra Leone really worked. And it doesn't have to involve the army necessarily. There should be a structure of a similar nature that has, uh, you know, the, that's empowered to coordinate and it, it, is, it is the authority to release messages so that people are aware there is a reliable source of information. But more importantly, that also helped that structure enabled the donors, primarily different USAID, USAID to transfer funds directly uh, with relative you know, efficiency and quickly, uh, which was really yeah. encouraging uh, for a, a re, an, an emergency response and it, it enhanced the collaboration. So in an emergency situation, the issue of funding also, uh, you know, caused uh, unnecessary delays, uh, but a strong coordination center that, that brings all the different subcommittees is, is uh, important. Thank you. So thank you. 
no, thank you very much, Michael. I'm sorry to um, to push you a little no. bit. Uh, um, uh, because what uh, what you're describing is really fundamentally important for us, because we need to learn from the Ebola experience, and you've described it. Um, before I open it up for questions, I just want to share some slides with colleagues. So th this is data to bring it back to COVID-19. This is data that was released uh, two days ago, um, and it was collected by a partnership for evidence-based response to COVID-19. Uh, and you can see the partners listed at the bottom. It's uh, principally for the Africa Center for Disease Control. And to the left, you can see um, the notified, uh, notifiable caseload per country. And these are the top six African countries. And you can see South Africa is way um, deep into um, a very high uh, infection rate. On the right-hand side, they asked, these are national surveys run by Ipsos. And they are simply ask the question, if a vaccine becomes available, will you be willing to take it? You can see what the figures are. Uh, the least uh, well-performing countries, Tunisia at 35%, followed by Kenya, uh, then South Africa, then Ethiopia, and then Egypt. Um, so that's, um, that's the results. And it's just an indication of what the scale of our challenge is, because those are not good figures at all. This is... Um, uh, a slide that shows the top three reasons why people did not want to be vaccinated. And you can see, if you look at by category, um, what is quite significant is the first one, people who actually deny that a virus exists, um, those who believe that they're not at risk. And then I really want you to note the third one, there's people who simply don't know enough. They don't have enough information to make a decision. You can see how significant that is. Um, and then the second one from the bottom, uh, vaccine is perceived as being developed too quickly and it was rushed, it was properly tested and so on. The key thing I like to draw your attention to is uh, the category don't know enough to make a decision. These are citizens who simply are hungry for information and they don't, they don't have it. And that is what risk communication, that gap has to fill together with uh, those who deny the fact that the virus exists. So the takeaways, th this is the slide that indicate who the most trusted people are um, and the most trusted institutions by country as well, by category. Uh, and you can see the importance of uh, physicians, community health workers, health, hospitals and health centers, sometimes ministries of health and national public institutes and medical professional association, how important they are. They're the trusted individuals. In some countries, the WHO and UNICEF are important. In two countries, it's religious institutions. And then very significantly in the case of Tunisia and partly in the case of Egypt, although it doesn't show up here, the army and police have a lot of moral authority, uh, but in other countries it does not. So I thought I'd share those slides with you um, as an entry point into the discussion around, um, around how we maximize vaccine take up through effective risk communication uh, on, the, on the African continent. So if I got, we have, to, we have 10 to 15 minutes for discussion and I just wanted to turn back to Donda Hansen. Um, uh, given her description of the experience um, in the DRC to tell us what the most important piece of advice you would give to people who are leading risk communication campaigns in the African continent and elsewhere. What is the most important lesson that uh, you would want to share with them in terms of how they drive risk communication given this particular pandemic, which has particular characteristics? It's a coronavirus. It's not, it's not a uh, uh, a hemorrhagic fever virus like Ebola. Um, and so um, the question of vaccine supplies is different uh, and so on. So the characteristics of this pandemic is very different. What would be the most important piece of advice? Uh, I'm also gonna ask Michael the same question. So, but first over to you, John. Yeah, so I think making sure that accurate, credible information is provided early on is probably one of the most important things 
one of our, we have some principles at, at CDC on our, our crisis and emergency risk communication, and it's be first, be right, and be credible. Because very often people go back to that first source of information, first, first, first credible um, you know, source um, for information time after time after time. And if officials want to be that source of information, they can't hesitate. I've had the opportunity to teach um, risk communication in, in many countries around the globe. And one of the things that's always asked is that the officials don't want to say anything until they have all the information. And, and that doesn't work. Um, it just allows the opportunity for misinformation to grow. Uh, so if we want people to come to the official source for information, we have to talk right away. Um, if that information is, is yours to share, share it first and, and make sure it's from a credible source. But the key is that you don't know everything first. So you have to talk about what you know what you don't know and what you're going to do to find that information or where the response is going and then and then provide regular updates. So I, I think that's that's the key piece is to, to don't let that information vacuum fill up with misinformation. Uh, make sure that the official sources are providing accurate information early on and, and make sure you're saying what you don't know and when you'll get that information to them. Over. Okay, okay, that's a, that's a great answer. Thank you very much. Um, that slide, that one slide that I showed uh, where the, the question was asked, whom do you trust the most? It clearly varies by country, it varies by culture, it varies by region, uh, and it varies by deep personal ex experience that people have with dealing with state agencies. In the case of South Africa, a long history of apartheid uh, and a role of the military in suppressing internal dissent, people don't trust the military very much, but they trust, um, they they trust the medical association and so on. So risk communication, apropos your point, has to be smartly tailored um, so that the right people communicate the messages, the message has to be primed and so on. So thank you very much for that uh, response, Danda. I wanted to turn to Michael, but on a diff different subject. In the Q&A and in the chat function, there's a lot of discussion, healthy discussion uh, going on about the role of religious institutions, um, both in uh, providing misinformation or uh, feeding into the anti-vaxxer movements but also religious organizations are very helpful. And I remember in the case of the DRC that the Catholic church played a really positive role in many parts of the DRC where there was no state presence. Um, and so I was just gonna ask you if you can just reflect for all of us on how religious institutions can play a very positive role in terms of vaccine communication and vaccine rollout. Um, okay, I'll, I'll give you a very good example that uh, still, you know, lingers on my head uh, from Sierra Leone. Uh, when uh, the vaccine trials started, uh, there were still some resistance, um, and uh, we involved the interreligious council. But the uh, one of the religious leaders was chairing the council. Was a Muslim leader. Uh, came out and uh, made an encouragement to the public uh, that this is, uh, you know, useful. But then the, the Catholic bishop who followed him, the, all of them spoke, uh, he said something that still lingers on my head. And he mentioned, uh, my people, this is uh, the answer to our prayers. We, we prayed for a solution and God has answered our prayer. So if we participate in this, this is how God is going to provide a solution. Because, you know, if there are miracles, he said, you know, it's how quick they have developed this vaccine. That's a miracle. God cannot come and, and uh, you know, do the healing himself, but he uses people, he uses uh, the scientists. And that, I think that message resonated with a lot of people. Uh, so this is how they, they can play related to their normal duty, their, their religious duty, you know, Muslim, Christian, or other faith related to their faith, but then sh show the benefits 
uh, of this to the people. And individuals also, I would add, individuals who are getting vaccinated. I think if each person goes to their respective friends and, and ask them, I've been vaccinated, did you? Or have you have you been vaccinated? That, that is also going to add some sort of, you know, uh, pressure on people, but it will also show them that this is not harm, 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 it's not harmful. Uh, here in Malawi, uh, if I can mention one thing, in, in Zomba, this is one district, uh, a couple of uh, weeks ago, there was no one turning up to take the vaccine. And last week, there was a queue of people trying to, to get vaccinated. And I contribute that largely to what I just mentioned, because each of the person who was vaccinated would go out and, and they are asking others, their friends, their colleagues, I took the vaccine, have you? Uh, so that, that's what I would say. So thank, thank you very much for that, uh, uh, Michael. Let me say that um, um, there are a number of uh, issues that came up in the Q&A. Um, there's one comment uh, from uh, Susan Goldstein is, uh, and it's directed at me asking, in, she says, in South Africa, what percent of people have a family doctor? Looks like to me that the survey is slanted towards the middle class. Uh, to say that I use the shorthand, it's uh, experience with family doctors, physicians, and uh, physicians working at clinics as well. So um, the actual survey had a sample of over 1,400. It was nationally representative, and it covered uh, all the classes within South Africa. So, so that was the response. Um, I just, there are a number of other comments also in the Q&A about the role of religious leaders. It's a really important subject, this. Uh, but also the role of traditional leaders. Uh, and it seems to me that one of the key lessons that uh, comes from the Ebola experience and from other experiences dealing with epidemics, that uh, the role of, um, of traditional uh, healers and religious leaders are clearly very, very vitally important in communicating sensible, honest, science-based um, pandemic response information to citizens. And one of the challenges we face is to put together uh, systems of risk communication that can achieve those goals, drawing on the wide spectrum of leaders um, uh, in society. So this is, this is uh, um, the time when leaders must rise to the occasion, where they must step up to the plate, where they must participate and not stand on the sidelines. And clearly the lessons here is that we need to um, upscale our efforts to develop those bottom-up risk communication systems. So uh, to close the session, if I can just thank uh, Dr. Hansen and, um, and uh, Mr. Kabrab for their uh, contributions. Um, she has uh, um, uh, stepped out, but also just to go back to our keynote, uh, Dr. Kanem, for uh, laying the, the groundwork for the discussions that we had now. And if I can now uh, close this uh, session and, um, and turn it over to Dr. Jennifer Dawn, who um, is uh, an academic um, and also a nurse and midwife uh, practitioner uh, at Columbia's School of Nursing. Um, and she is one of uh, the colleagues that I've worked with uh, in a project called Frontline Nurses, um, um, together with Victoria Rosner. So um, um, over to you, Jennifer, uh, to then introduce the next session. Thank you, Wilmot. Um, what a great start of, of, of speakers and an engaging panel. Um, I have the honor of introducing Simone Carter, who's the lead for UNICEF's Public Health Emergencies and is her support to countries to better integrate and op operationalize evidence in outbreak response. In the Democratic Republic of Congo's Ebola response beginning in 2018 and currently in Guinea. Um, Simone, uh, please join us. So we look forward to your remarks on using integrated analytics to inform vaccine related communication. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm calling from Nzara Corey. Uh, 
in Guinea Forest Yo, so the internet hopefully will stay. So um, thanks very much for the opportunity to present today. Um, so just a little bit about what I'll, I'll cover. So I will um, go over a little bit of what are the key results from the different um, studies on vaccination uh, during the 10th and 11th Ebola outbreaks in the DRC. Um, how we've adapted the questions based on the learning from uh, the Eastern DRC outbreak for questions on household and healthcare worker surveys for COVID. Uh, show a little bit about what those results actually look like um, and talk about some guidance of how we could better use social sciences evidence in terms of communication and community engagement on vaccination. Um, just very quickly, um, what is the social sciences analytic cell? So, the unit was set up in 2018 uh, to support the uh, Ebola DRC outbreak. So um, in recent outbreaks, we've gotten better and better about having uh, epidemiological analysis cells, uh, being able to show more about differential trends in the outbreak, uh, transmission chains. However, one of the things that really misses is explaining why. So uh, why more children might be affected in one area or another, why there might be greater community deaths in one way than another. And so setting up the CAS was a way to better explain the different epidemiological trends that we were seeing. Um, the unit working together with epidemiologists, DHS2, so health services use data um, as well, was signed off by the Ministry of Health to provide systematic integrated evidence to better explain outbreak, outbreak dynamic. Uh, that has since been replicated in the DRC for the 11th Ebola outbreak in Ecuador, for COVID, now for cholera, um, and has been replicated here as well in Guinea um, as an integrated analytics cell. Um, so we do this support across multiple countries. And really the aim is to conduct rapid surveys to better understand outbreak dynamics, to support different actors in using this evidence. So it's not enough to do a presentation, it's important to present the data from local health authorities to NGOs to ministries of health and seeing how the data can be better used uh, by all the different kinds of actors that would be in the response. Um, helping them co-develop actions. So and really tracking those over time. I think we have a tendency of presenting a lot of evidence but missing how the evidence is being used and how we can really see if that works or not. Um, we really create a space for integrated multidisciplinary outbreak analytics. And what that means is understanding that Factors that influence outbreaks or health behavior go beyond the disease itself. They might be socioeconomic, um, gender-based, uh, conflict, displacement, um, other health services data as well. So really making sure that we're looking at everything holistically, not at one disease on its own. Um, and of course, working through national uh, partners and researchers uh, and institutions. So just sharing first some key results of the data that we have from the 10th and 11th uh, Ebola uh, outbreaks in the DRC. Um, something that I, someone said previously as well, but it's an important distinction to make when we're taking experience from the Eastern DRC context and talking about uh, the COVID vaccine. We want to remember that in, in the DRC, we were talking about a phase three vaccination trial, which is not the same case here. So what that meant was that um, consent forms were being used. Those consent forms were often not in languages which were understood. Uh, words like trial and experiment were being used as well, um, which are things that can fuel distrust. Um, so there are amazing tools that have since been developed on, on COVID by the WHO that actually show the different phases of a vaccine and a vaccine trial and rollouts, um, which can help to address some of that, um, that language issue. So this presentation is based on a meta-synthesis um, from multiple studies. So we have in the Eastern DRC, 14 different CAS studies, which covered over 4,000 individuals, um, household surveys, healthcare worker surveys, and qualitative uh, surveys or studies as well. In Ecuador from June and July 2020, so that's the 11th outbreak, the second one in Ecuador uh, in those two years. Um, it covers 117 of the 189 healthcare facilities in the area and household surveys, which reached over 2,000 individuals in the, um, in the seven health zones. So some kind of key summary about community perceptions. What we saw is that almost half of community members uh, reported that people refused the vaccine because of an issue with eligibility criteria. Um, so the concept of ring vaccination. So when we're thinking again about COVID vaccines, it will be important for us to reflect on uh, the fact that this is a vaccine, again, that will not be available for everyone. 
Um, so how are we communicating clearly on who is eligible and who is not and why? 23% um, reported that they refused the vaccine because there was not sufficient information. So that was something that Wilmot also raised um, that is showing in the PERC data. Um, so this, this concept of how are we correctly communicating and giving the information that is requested by communities to support their engagement with vaccines. Um, also just between 47 and 62% reported that communities have become afraid of vaccine, vaccinating their children because they were scared that it would be the Ebola vaccine. So again, this comes back to when we are talking about vaccines um, or looking at data around vaccines, how are we ensuring that we are looking holistically at everything that is happening with vaccines and not only the one uh, disease at a time? Uh, when we look at healthcare worker perceptions, um, we saw that 42 to 55 percent of healthcare workers said that they needed more information. So again, what we're seeing from the PERC data, for example, is that people want the information from healthcare workers. But are we actually ensuring that how healthcare workers have the information that they need? Uh, in the epicenter in Beni, um, at the end of the outbreak, so uh, in 2020, only 21% had reported receiving training on being able to explain the vaccines. So we are not equipping the right people with the right information to be able to respond and build that trust. And 65% of healthcare workers said that people were refusing the vaccine because they were scared of side effects. Despite the fact that most people know that vaccines have side effects, because we're not sufficiently equipping them with information on how it works and what are the side effects, this again can be something that could be answered easily if the information and the training was provided. When we look at the key results from Equator, um, so the community results, we see that the majority of, of communities had heard of the Ebola vaccine. Again, this was the 11th outbreak, so they had one in 2018 and again in 2020. Um, we did ask if the vaccine was offered, would you accept it? And almost half uh, still said no. So the reason for refusing vaccine, uh, one was about a distrust. Um, but 34% about it being infected, about being concerned that the vaccine itself would infect them. And I think this comes back again to, we're very quick to say things like, um, oh, that's a rumor, or um, that's something, you know, that's, that's a lie, that's a rumor, that's a misinformation. Whereas actually, it often comes from misunderstanding the concepts of things like antibodies, which have been trained and have been talked about, and everybody understands how a polio vaccine works, for example. So rather than uh, disregarding those kinds of misinformation, it's actually more important to take them and address them and say, why do you think that it would infect you? What is the information that made you think that? And how can we address that more holistically and answer those questions? Um, 31 to 42% reported that they didn't believe Ebola was in the area. And this is something that came up as well in the, in the COVID presentation uh, from the PERC data. And I think we need to be very honest about understanding proximity to a disease and our willingness to engage in any prevention me measure with something that we are not aware of. Um, so we are much more likely to engage in preventive measures, whether that is vaccine, hand washing, safe and dignified burrows, whatever those be, when we have had that disease close by, when somebody in our family has been affected. When we are more affected by malnutrition, measles and malaria, that might be our biggest priority. And as responders, we need to consider that very, very clearly in how we communicate or try to engage in one vaccine that we are then considering and including the other needs of communities at the same time. So looking at the healthcare worker results, uh, again, in Equitor, uh, again, the majority of them uh, were aware of the vaccine um, and the majority did believe that it works. However, 49% of healthcare workers still had not been vaccinated. Um, and the reasons for not being vaccinated, uh, again, some of it comes about information. So 18% didn't know where to even get vaccinated. So we're, we're very quick to say people are resistant or uh, hesitant or not engaging, but actually we're not recognizing how little information we provide them if 18% don't even know where they can get vaccinated. Again, we see the concern about side effects by 46%. Um, and again, it comes back to what information are we truly providing about a vaccine to be able to address these concerns? And how are we comparing that to information uh, that people already know about vaccines and how they work? So in summary of all of this data, there are kind of some key themes that came out over the two years. One is about misunderstanding and misinformation, which all focused around the side effects 
and the eligibility um, criteria and strategy. So the fact that the ring vaccination was something that was confusing, that there was no communication materials on. Um, this could be done very simply, either with practical examples of groups of individuals, moving people physically around, saying how you would be a contact or a contact of a contact, um, or through images or videos, et cetera. But those communication materials did not exist to help people understand that eligibility criteria. Changes in eligibility criteria, so um, including pregnant investigating women and how this changed over time. Uh, distrust was related to a lack of understanding of how it worked. So again, we have tons of videos of how polio vaccines work or how other vaccines work, um, but we lack videos uh, or, or communication materials on how the Ebola vaccine works. Um, we promoted the vaccine, so this comes again to eligibility, but then we didn't offer it for everybody. We said to people, this is a life-saving vaccine, and then, but you, you and you can't have it. So a really good example is this image that we have uh, here is that the posters were accept the vaccine. Telling people to accept something without explaining how it works, what the side effects are, why you would receive it and somebody else wouldn't are not ways to build trust. Um, that the vaccine was provided in unusual locations, so tents or outside of healthcare facilities. Uh, that there was use of presence um, in the vaccine locations. So again, if we want to normalize and engage people with the vaccine, we cannot treat that vaccine or that disease differently from others. And that means that vaccine locations and procedures need to be the same as for other vaccines. Um, so this also goes for locations, ethical forms, police and military, um, all of those unusual aspects. Um, and ensuring that the vaccines are being done by healthcare workers who are trusted, um, and that those healthcare workers have sufficient information to explain why somebody would get it, why others wouldn't, how it works, what are the side effects, et cetera. And again, being able to paint this in a holistic picture against other vaccines as well. So just how we've adapted some of the surveys based on all of this kind of lessons learned. Um, so I think one of the things that has been really key for us is Asking if you would accept the vaccine is just not a safe question. We've actually taken that question out of any of our surveys. Um, it has a tendency to create defiant or hesitant communities. So saying 40% of people wouldn't accept a vaccine when it's a hypothetical question um, actually pits us a bit against communities. Um, we're not asking, we're not looking at that data against what is the political view? What is your government's view? What are the leaders saying? Do you know somebody who has COVID or not? Uh, do you have somebody else um, who is high risk in your family? So all of these factors would influence a hypothetical answer. And what we do know is the vaccine is coming. The vaccine is coming to all countries. So whether they would accept it or not is not as important as what information they need, who they need it from, how they can get it, and then responding to their actual needs with actionable types of questions and, and actions which follow. Um, this would result in campaigns which are focused on, on, on providing the information across the modalities and through the right people that, that are trusted, rather than campaigns which are focused on telling people, accept the thing that you hypothetically said you wouldn't. And so how we think that better data can get better used is, is one mixing qualitative and quantitative data. So really understanding not just perceptions, but the causes and the drivers for those perceptions. Um, asking action-oriented questions. What information do you need? When do you need it? How do you need it? From who? Um, ensuring that the data users are involved in the survey creation. So when we do healthcare worker surveys, we involve all of the different actors who work with healthcare workers, not just those who work in vaccines, but they're involved in the survey creation so that they're better, better and more likely to use the data when it comes out. This includes Ministry of Health, but also NGOs. Um, and really also not focusing on COVID-19 alone, but looking at vaccination holistically. What do you know about vaccines? What information do you understand about vaccines? Um, has there been impact on other vaccine use? Uh, how do you feel about vaccinating your children? All those other factors together uh, in one single survey so that we have a more holistic understanding of outbreak dynamics and the different dynamics engaging with vaccines. So just very briefly, I'll finish with showing some examples of how this data looks uh, in the new healthcare worker surveys that we've conducted uh, in January 2018, or 2018, sorry, 2021. Um, so this is representative uh, of the uh, representative sampling from the healthcare workers uh, in Kinshasa. 
Um, so what we saw is that the confidence about the vaccine right now is all over the place. So this will give us kind of a baseline to see if we address the questions, if we respond with the actions that are requested, will this change over time in terms of confidence level? So we ask about the fears of the concerns on the new vaccine. And again, we see the side effects. So it, it really makes it important for us to talk about communication that clarifies what side effects look like and compares this to things that are already known for side effects of vaccines. Um, we also ask what information you would like to have. So again, number one, side effects, um, how the vaccine works, how long it lasts, uh, and what's in it and who will receive it. So this, this information is available and communicating on the fact that some of the information we don't know is also okay, but here's where you'll be able to get it and here's how we will update that information and this is why we don't know that information yet. And again, being able to compare that to things that people know. So for example, we all know that the yellow fever vaccine used to be on, uh, for, for 10 years and then had to be reboosted, now it doesn't. So these kinds of comparisons, especially with people like healthcare workers can be used to help them better understand and find ways to communicate better with communities. Um, but as much as possible, bringing it back to things that they know and making those kinds of comparisons. We also ask who you would like to receive the information from. And because this is done at one health, health area level, so it's done in Kinshasa, we know that this is right for Kinshasa, but we will do it across the country in different locations so that we're making sure that that is adapted appropriately, recognizing that for healthcare workers and communities that might be different. Um, but again, as was echoed in the PERC data, um, the importance of working with medical leaders in the area um, and who those are and how they are the ones who should have the right information and be efficiently equipped, so sufficiently equipped to be able to communicate on this correctly. Um, so just a quick reminder on the, on the guidance, uh, really important to repeat surveys over time to check are the information needs being met by type and by source of information. Um, are we presenting the results of this kind of work uh, only at big forums or only in reports? Or are we really going and hosting meetings with the WASH cluster, the health clusters, uh, the different NGOs, the different departments of the Ministry of Health, um, with Gabby, et cetera, to say, what are you doing with this data? How is this coming across across you report, Kinshasa Digital, um, all of the youth associations, and making sure that everybody actually has access to this data in a way that is usable for them? Um, when co-developed recommendations are done, documenting them and tracking them. So seeing what does work and being able to monitor that over time. I think we're with COVID, we're being very data obsessed in terms of collecting data. We collect big data, um, but we're not using that or tracking that at a granular level of how we're adapting. So that's really critical. Um, and finally, recognizing sometimes we don't even need studies. Sometimes we just need to engage communities, um, but that also perception surveys at large levels are often harder to use than granular qualitative data as well uh, at a community level, especially things like recognizing when there might be a high risk group or a particular vulnerable population that we want to be reaching and engaging with. And um, so just to again reiterate, everything we do is open access, the tools, the presentations, the training, the results, it's all available online um, so that we wanna ensure that anybody can use anything that is out there. So please don't hesitate to get in touch if any of that can be useful for you. Thanks very much. Thank you, Simone. Uh, it was such a refreshing discussion on, on really um, honesty and transparency and how we engage in community, um, being direct, listening so that we can provide um, solid answers and it really opens the door about the social science approaches to um, paving the way for all vaccinations. I think this is very important. Um, yes, we want, we're now talking about the COVID-19 vaccine, but there are polio, there's a, um, you know, yellow fever. Vaccines in general are an issue and to raise it into the context and to take this evidence you've gathered really is so helpful. There's so many important um, lessons here of what we, what's already been established that we can incorporate. So um, greatly appreciate what you said. And thank you for taking time to be able to join us in your incredibly busy day. So we will now go on to um, panel two, uh, which is discussing, discussing community partnerships. Uh, we are going to explore a different angle or perspective of risk 
um, communication response to crises, including vaccine hesitancy. We need coordinated global, regional, and national efforts to direct response to catastrophic situations, from wars to forced migration to outbreaks of infectious diseases. And we need organized and recognized communities, the peoples within the country, to bring their wisdom and knowledge of what they need and how it is to be delivered as equal authority in directing strategies and solutions. I pose two premises uh, as a framework for this discussion and for our experts who will present shortly. One is an engaged community is essential for effective crisis response. And two, to have an engaged community, a system of primary healthcare needs to be in place. This means there have been sound investments in public health components, such as health systems and health workforce that result in a community having trust and being engaged in their own health outcome. Crises are portals that provide clarity to the existing fractures within societies. And crises such as pandemics unfold in specific and distinct contexts into global North and global South countries with their ongoing legacies of inequities and disparities. They invade and inhabit the social structures of how this country is governed and its very societal and foundations. In the United States during this COVID-19 pandemic, for example, with its health, health institutions being built on structural racism and exclusion, the rates of infection and death for black people and people of color more than double that of white people with much lower rates of vaccinations. Combine this with years of medical experimentation and poor access to quality healthcare, it is no mystery when communities of color question the safety of vaccines. It is in this context that risk communication must be relevant in order to be effective. In global South countries, and specifically in African countries, the legacies of the onslaught of colonialism, global slave trade, and exploitation as weapons of the invaders have often left clinical deserts with minimal investment in maintenance of public health infrastructure. Global guidelines must be contextualized into the specific conditions, and it is the community that possesses the expertise to do this if they are given agency. The paradigm of containment versus care emerges within these contexts, too frequently with a focus on containment rather than attention to the basic health needs of the community. The central dilemma here is whether effective containment is possible without safe and effective care. So now you will hear from four experts with long histories of engagement with communities to ensure their voices and their understanding of what is needed for effective crisis communication response strategies. They will also share what it means to communicate risks in situations where governments might not be effective in doing this due to unstable and fragile systems. So beginning, uh, I welcome Chinwe Ochu, Nigerian Center for Disease Control uh, to address this. Uh, Chinwe has a lengthy history in prevention of infectious diseases, including risk communication during polio outbreaks in Nigeria, and is now leading the COVID-19 risk communication strategies in Nigeria. Uh, Chinwe, please join us. Thank you very much, um, Jennifer. Hi, everyone. I um, want to appreciate this opportunity to share the Nigerian experience uh, in community partnerships and engagement, especially as it pertains to our COVID-19 vaccine response. Uh, let me start with a disclaimer that um, uh, as a country, we have done a lot and we're doing a lot, but we have not done enough we keep learning from the process and from our past experiences, and we keep uh, improving and adjusting our strategy uh, to be able to deliver on our mandate to, to our, our country and our communities. We have, over time, uh, learned the importance of community partnership. Uh, we've had to deal with the Ebola outbreak in 2014. That was a good learning experience for us, as, as well as uh, the, the, the uh, um, polio eradication program, where we have seen that engaging the community at every stage of our public health development and uh, implementation of strategies is more effective than using the top-down approach uh, that we have uh, highlighted uh, over the course of this meeting. So 
Community partnership and engagement is one of the five pillars of uh, risk communication. And designing with end users, we have also seen, is key to behavioral change. For our response to the COVID-19 outbreak, and especially as we roll out vaccines, we have adopted uh, the WHO Global Routine Immunization Strategies and Practices, which we also utilize in our polio response. And this endorses community involvement and espouses uh, strategies for community partnership as a way to improve uh, the uptake of vaccines. Let me start by uh, bringing out the Nigerian context so that we understand the complexity around community engagement and risk communication in the country. We are a nation of over 250 ethnic groups with more than 500 languages. You can imagine that that uh, would mean that we have a lot of sociocultural diversities. And what strategy we use in communicating risk in one part of the country may not necessarily be effective in another part. So contextualism uh, has been a key strategy that we have used, adapting uh, our risk communication interventions to the particular context in our country. Wide socioeconomic disparity is another big challenge uh, where you have um, people on very rich people and very poor and people with different uh, uh, access to level of access to healthcare services uh, and programs. So this makes it difficult for you to be able to communicate, especially the seeds that is people on the top of the ladder that are trying to communicate to those uh, uh, at the lower steps of the ladder. So. These are things we take into consideration in trying to engage the community. And of course, a lot of religious diversities that also bring up um, differences in the way people perceive uh, our public health interventions. Fragile communities, we in the northern part of the country and other parts of the country, we have uh, communities that are faced with different kinds of uh, insecurity issues. We have the Boko Haram insurgency and so many other issues with a lot of um, uh, IDPs, uh, internally displaced, uh, displaced persons. So making sure that these people who are also part of our communities have equal access to uh, uh, public health, risk communication, messages and interventions uh, is very key in our community engagement efforts. We also have that power disparity that um, in a patriarchal society, that means that we could also have these uh, diversities in access across the various genders and the various uh, power structures. So these are all things that are unique to our country. Um, we, that makes it very, very important that what, whatever approach we are adopting is what will be able to address the needs of the specific targets uh, of our public health uh, uh, programs. We have developed a risk communication and community engagement strategy, uh, which was what came out of this uh, response to COVID-19. And it outlines uh, uh, how we communicate with the public, our stakeholder and partner engagement. And we emphasize a lot capacity building on risk communication and community engagement. We have understood the importance of um, opinion leaders and trusted voices, I think, this has been, this cannot be overemphasized. We've had a lot of it from the previous speakers. We train these ones, we engage them, and we make use of them to communicate with and to help to promote public health interventions. Uh, our risk communication engagement strategy is based on the overall goal of providing people with information and options they need to make informed decisions and to take actions that save lives and lead to recovery. Another interesting aspect of our strategy is the dynamic listening and rumor management uh, uh, efforts and strategy that we have, which I will speak about as we go on. This is the summary of our risk of our community engagement strategy. We carry out surveys. We try to understand what do people feel about what is happening? What are their perceptions? And then we engage community influencers to disseminate information. We also want to find out the concerns uh, of the communities. We engage them in dialogue. And what do they feel about the desired behavior that we are preaching to them to adopt? And we stimulate the community themselves to lead and own the response. This is the core component of our community engagement uh, strategy. And we try to, as we learn from the whole process to improve by the day. This is an example of um, some of the opinion leaders and trusted voices 
uh, that we make use of in our public health interventions. We're in Nigeria, and as well as in many other parts of Africa and the world, our conspiracy theories, uh, the conspiracy theories have been, they've had religious and cultural undertones. So we discovered that making use of these faith-based and traditional organizations and their leaders and making them champions for public health programs and interventions have been very, very effective. We equip them with necessary trainings, we provide facts, evidence-based facts, and then let them catch the vision and run with it and identify the uh, effective strategy for communicating uh, these interventions to their own people. We support community influencers and volunteers. We have them to craft their own promotional and risk communication messages that are evidence-based, but yet specific to the needs of their community. What have we uh, adopted as our COVID-19 strategy? Like I said before, we've leveraged on most of our polio experience uh, in eradication of polio. We have several structures. The Emergency Operations Center that is multi-sectoral is a platform where relevant stakeholders are engaged in activities. And for COVID-19, I'm happy to announce that we were able to uh, activate emergency operation centers in all the 36 states and the federal capital territory of the country. So in every state of this country, we have an active EOC that is able to respond to public health emergencies. We've, uh, for the polio eradication, we leverage a lot on the Committee of Northern Traditional Rulers, and we are making use of them as well in our response to COVID. The military and civilian joint task force have been our partners in helping to reach the security compromised communities. So they are part of our EOCs, they are part of our technical working groups. We've partnered with civil society organizations and humanitarian organizations who already have community presence, especially in difficult to reach communities and in uh, uh, internally displaced persons uh, camps. So we make use of them rather than reinventing the wheel, we use them to reach these people. In Nigeria, we have what development committees and relay de development committees at the community level. And these people help to drive ownership from the communities. So we have been making use of them in all the other responses and we are still making use of them for COVID-19 vaccination. The PAC survey has, has further um, uh, underscored the importance of healthcare workers as trusted voices in risk communication. So Nigeria has prioritized the training of these frontline workers on COVID-19 vaccination. Our target is to train over 100,000 of them. And it is a, a national primary healthcare development agency that is leading our vaccination efforts in the country. Like I said before, we listen to the community. We try to see what is happening. And that is what we call dynamic listening. And we have an integrated remote management where we use um, a particular digital app to scan social media, scan off media platforms for trending news. We want to understand what are those information that are trending? Are they risky? Are, are there misconceptions or misinformation? Are, are there speculations that could uh, affect negatively the health of the community? And once we do that, we collect all these things, we investigate, we analyze, and we take decisions based on them. And it informs the development of our risk communication and messages. We feedback, we disseminate, and then we get feedback from the community using this very robust mechanism of um, rumor management. In 2019, Nigeria trained nationwide healthcare workers on adverse events following immunization, but we have further strengthened that this year, including targeted models on COVID-19 vaccines. The AF AEFI committees uh, that we've had before now have not been that functional, but we're happy that the National Agency for Food and Drug uh, Administration and Control has introduced a med safety app, uh, which is a digital app that supports pharmacovigilance. So people are able to report real time uh, adverse reactions following immunization. So this is a key improvement on our strategy. I brought borrowed this uh, slide from the National Primary Healthcare Development Agency to show us some of our community engagement efforts. You can see uh, the religious leaders, the traditional rulers, uh, and even going to the marketplace to interact with the people more closely. Um, these are some of the things we're doing. 
uh, to make sure that whatever strategy we're using, that we have the people participating in every aspect of that strategy. The TEACH strategy is what um, Nigeria is using to uh, enroll people into the vaccination uh, campaign. We were still using the traditional vaccination campaign approach, but beyond that, we have an electronic self-registration by eligible Nigerians and those who cannot uh, register themselves electronically, uh, we assist them in this registration. We have also conducted concomitant uh, vaccination alongside electronic registration. This will play out more when we go into community level uh, vaccination. We have house to house electronic registration. We used this approach before and we intend to use it for our COVID-19 vaccination. What have been our challenges? We have a very fragile health system uh, that has suffered from decades of supply investments. And um, this is a big challenge. And uh, we are hoping that we will keep overcoming as we keep uh, progressing. Our community involvement and risk communication activities are new. They are not, we are, they are not typically prioritized in the country. So, but the lessons we are learning from our COVID-19 response and from NASA fever and um, Ebola response has uh, made us uh, to bring to the fore the importance of this uh, strategy in our efforts. Mistrust of government has affected our COVID-19 response, and this has led to also hesitancy to COVID-19 vaccines. But our rumor management system is helping us to address most of those misinformations. And this also highlights the need of transparency in the government so that people will trust whatever strategy we have. We don't just assume that we know what the problem is and want to address it. People must see us as being uh, faithful to our promises and that whatever we are providing for them are backed by science and evidence and that we really appreciate the role that the community has to play. We have learned the lesson that rolling out the COVID-19 vaccines must tap into our polio experiences uh, we've had a very successful polio eradication program, so we are learning lessons from that, and we are strengthening our routine immunization in the country. We, there is need for us to keep applying design thinking to our vaccination strategy so that we will always design with community and end users uh, participating in the design and implementation of our strategies. There is need to invest in strategies for community partnerships, both for this vaccination and health system strengthening. Like we cannot, uh, we cannot ignore the fact that we are one country does not have health security. No country in the world can say that they are safe. So we'll continue to do this to ensure that we support global health security. In conclusion, community partnerships must be deliberate and they must be designed to contain disease outbreaks and increase vaccine demand. Effective risk communication and community engagement must continue to take the bottom top approach. We must let the communities themselves, the community members themselves, identify what their problems are, what are their priorities, and profile solutions to addressing those problems. We equip them with all they need to be able to do that. That is the concept of empowerment. Vaccine inequities are not only between countries, even within a country, we can have cross cutting. Uh, 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 we, we can have uh, vaccine inequities and we need cross-cutting community partnership to be able to address that. So let me leave us with this favorite um, phrase for community engagement that I have, which is that we should do it with them, not for them or on them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chime. Uh, so many lessons uh, learned from previous strategies, particularly around polio in Nigeria and you're, you're discussing the role of traditional leaders, uh, making them champions as risk communications is a theme that's been going throughout the, the question and answer period and we will return to that later, I am sure. So thank you for those wise remarks. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Stefano Cordello from the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. Uh, he's currently based in Libya and has been on the front line of humanitarian response during wars and forced migration and looking at response within uh, fragile, unstable situations uh, to pandemic response. So Stefano, join us, please. 
Thank you, Jennifer, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Thanks a lot to the uh, Institute for uh, Research for uh, Social Economic uh, Research and Policy for inviting me to be here with you today. I would like to use the next uh, 10 minutes to share uh, my experience on uh, uh, risk communication and community engagement uh, in, uh, in Libya. And uh, in sharing these thoughts, I would like to frame uh, our experience. Uh, I'm, operating, I'm working in Libya with the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. And uh, as, uh, as IFRC, as we call it, we work hand in hand with our uh, membership uh, national societies. In this case, uh, in the case of Libya, of course, the Libya Red Crescent Society. So I would like to share with you our, uh, our experience. Let me start first uh, from, uh, from Libya. Um, Libya fell into chaos uh, after the uprising in, uh, in 2011. And the country remained uh, split between uh, two rival administrations, uh, the, the West and the East, each one backed by different uh, armed groups and foreign powers uh, for several years. And only uh, very recently, only a few weeks ago, uh, the country reunited, although it's still a very complex and volatile situation, a political dialogue promoted by the United Nations uh, reached uh, a, a ceasefire last, uh, last October and uh, made uh, progress towards uh, agreeing on a transitional uh, government. Uh, this led on uh, March 15 to a government of national unity swearing in, uh, in Tripoli, the capital of, uh, of Libya. And this, uh, this government was mandated uh, to bring together uh, the country that uh, was divided for, uh, for a number of years. Uh, a number of uh, challenges, however, still remain. Uh, first of all, we have now, we have had uh, for two weeks a government of national unity that should lead to uh, elections in December 2021. Uh, among the challenges, however, that are on the way, uh, there are two main concerns uh, that make uh, Libya still a very complex and volatile situation. But first of all, the number of uh, foreign fighters, there are still, uh, it is estimated there are still 20,000 foreign fighters in Libya, and the ineffectiveness of the arms embargo. Arms uh, weapons are still entering uh, Libya. So although there, although there have been uh, over the last uh, few months and uh, few weeks a number of positive developments, the environment remains still uh, complex. Uh, the last uh, 10 years, uh, over the last 10 years, we witnessed the deterioration of, uh, or the partial collapse of living standards of the Libyan population and uh, basic services. Uh, this, we witness also the widespread uh, by a great violation of human rights uh, and uh, a significant impact on uh, physical and mental well-being of the affected population. Just to give you some, uh, some numbers, uh, Libya continues to, to struggle with, uh, with the effects of uh, insecurity as well as uh, social and economic uh, as well as governance crisis. And this was made even worse, of course, with, uh, with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, it is estimated that in 2020, uh, 2.5 million people have been uh, affected. And in, out of these 2.5 million people have been affected by the conflict uh, in general, the overall crisis, uh, 1.3 million were uh, in urgent need of uh, humanitarian uh, assistance. Uh, the, the, the escalation of the pandemic, uh, the, the pandemic also coincided with uh, the conflict escalation. And uh, we saw that at the very beginning of the, the pandemic, very few cases were reported, uh, indicating a vast uh, undercount. Uh, the pandemic, uh, the, pan the number of the pandemic uh, increased uh, immensely as uh, the conflict was declining, so toward the end of 2020. So while at the beginning there were very few cases, at the end of the, toward the end of the conflict escalation, the, the cases increased uh, exponentially. Uh, and what is feared is that, of course, Libya might be the, 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 kind, the situation, the kind of situation uh, where we might witness the perfect storm. So a full-blown uh, transmission of the pandemic uh, is, uh, is, uh, is feared. 
and the delivery system was already the, uh, was already overstretched and under resourced and under resourced before the COVID escalation that we witnessed in the spring of 2020. So the pandemic additionally added challenges to these uh, to the national health system. Uh, it is then uh, feared that the, the true scale of the pandemic in Libya, that now we are counting uh, roughly 160,000 uh, cases, might be much higher than what has been, uh, what has been uh, reported. Um, now, if I look at the, the work uh, that has been carried out by the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Cross Societies, together with the Libya Red Cross Center, uh, an important effort was carried out over the last few years uh, on uh, within the, the sphere of health uh, on uh, community-based health. And end in end, uh, there was an important effort on uh, uh, risk, uh, risk communication and uh, community engagement. Why did we focus so much on community-based health and uh, risk communication and community engagement? Well, this was First, uh, due to the, to the real strength of uh, the Libya Recreation Society. Uh, the Libya Recreation Society is probably the main, uh, probably is without any doubt, the main national humanitarian actor in, uh, in Libya. Over the last uh, few years, even during the conflict, uh, the Libya Recreation was the only actor that has uh, that unlimited access to the, to the country, to all parts of the country, through its branches, through its staff, but most importantly, through its uh, network of, uh, of volunteers. Uh, the national, the, the Libyan Recreation can count on a network of uh, at least 3,000 uh, active uh, volunteers. So it was easier for the National Society really to engage at the community level and then build, uh, to build on this. Um, in doing so, the National the Libyan Recreation was a better position than other actors really to intervene in order to, uh, to strengthen its role in uh, communica uh, risk communication and uh, community in, uh, engagement. And uh, it, was, uh, it was really well positioned to deliver messages that otherwise might not have been fully trusted by, by the population. Uh, it was uh, the, the, the ideal actor, and still is the ideal actor, uh, to address the effects of the conflict on the one hand, but also to uh, address the effects of the pandemic and to support the country's response to the, to the COVID-19 pandemic, and, the, uh, and of course, in doing so, uh, so the national and supporting the national health system. Um, in this effort, uh, there have been a number of activities that have been carried out by the, by the Libya Red Cross Center. There is a cooperation that has been explored with the National Center for Disease Control that will accompany the vaccination campaign in Libya. And how will they accompany? Will not be in, in delivering the vaccination itself, but really in raising awareness and delivering key messages to the, to the population. So strengthening uh, advocacy efforts, for example, to ensure equitable, equitable access to, uh, to immunization, immunization and uh, as well fostering trust, uh, social cohesion, civil res responsibility, and uh, public solidarity for the vaccine uptake. And uh, I know that my time is limited, but I'd like to share with you an effect that might uh, further enlighten the role that uh, has been played by the Libya Recession together with, uh, with the support of the International Federation uh, in terms of uh, uh, communication risk and community engagement. Uh, last year, at the very beginning of the pandemic, uh, an initiative was launched uh, in the city of Benghazi. Uh, Benghazi is not the capital of Libya, but it is where the uh, Libya Crescent is, uh, is based. So, in a way, it's, uh, it's stronger as a, a more rooted uh, presence. Uh, in March 2020, the, the, the Libya Crescent launched an initiative uh, called One Volunteer in Every Street. Uh, this initiative was uh, putting together uh, the, the, the capacity, the strength of the national society in uh, terms of uh, community-based health, together with uh, risk communication and community engagement. Uh, the, the national society sensed that there was, uh, sensed there was a need for supporting the communities during the pandemic uh, outbreak, 
uh, especially in terms of providing uh, the population the most vulnerable categories with uh, a trustworthy source uh, of information and, uh, and guidance. National study was starting already from a strong understanding of the context and, uh, and the gaps. And uh, how did this initiative proceed? Uh, well, first of all, there was uh, the leader aggression prepared the volunteer guide. Uh, we disseminated the volunteers. It already existed a network of volunteers uh, and uh, explained the goal of the initiative, uh, the objective, and so on. Uh, later on, there were an, an, uh, an attempt to increase. There was an attempt, there was a, an effort to increase the number of volunteers, especially in the city of Benghazi. And this effort led to the deployment of additional 700 uh, volunteers. Uh, there was a campaign that was uh, launched through social media for recruitment, uh, enrollment of these. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Bill, what I understand. Um, anyway, uh, what is important is that through this network of volunteers, they were selected and identified within the same community that they, they laid on, they were intervening on. Uh, over the first two weeks, just to give you an example, these uh, volunteers, they were able to, to, uh, to carry out uh, 2,000 door-to-door visits to, to families. Uh, what was important about this, uh, this, this initiative? Well, first of all, it was easy to implement uh, based on a, a already an existing network of volunteers. Uh, and this could be easily replicated in other contexts. Uh, Red Cross and Red Cross Society exist all over the world, and the strength of the network is really their, uh, their volunteer network. Uh, so this was already an easy step, and it was built upon an existing uh, Network. Uh, it did not require a lot of time to launch this uh, this initiative. Most importantly, it could. Uh, what we see, what was assessed, uh, is that uh, this initiative could be replicated, not only in the case of Libya, uh, but for sure in other similar uh, situation in uh, war torn countries. Uh, uh, where, however, national society already operate, and it could be also be uh, replicated uh, during the vaccination campaign. What was clear is that the population trusts much more the messages coming from members of its communities uh, than coming from other sources. And this is particularly relevant for the most vulnerable categories. Uh, and I would be happy to elaborate more, but I know that time is limited, uh, so I give the floor to Jennifer. Sorry, um, Jennifer just Sorry me to let me know that she's lost internet. Um, so I think we should probably just um, turn things over to our next speaker, who I believe is Sheila Davis from Partners in Health. Yes, great, thank you. So thanks so much. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with all of you today. Um, you can go to the next slide. Partners in Health is an international NGO, and we work in 11 countries globally. Um, and our, our big push in our philosophy during COVID is similar to what, what we've been doing for HIV, for TB and multi-drug resistant TB and Ebola, and for um, quality healthcare around the world, is um, with COVID, we really wanted to focus on treatments during the beginning of the epidemic excuse me, and, and not just containment as Jennifer alluded to at the beginning, but really focused on making sure the countries in which we work had access to oxygen, to safe facilities, uh, PPE, et cetera. When it comes to vaccines, we 100% we really believe that there needs to be safe and equitable access uh, to support the work globally and in the US. And part of the, a big piece of this in supporting the increase in supply of vaccines it's obviously looking at supply. And we've joined in with many organizations in advocacy efforts to focus on the people's vaccine effort, as well as supporting COVAX, which was WHO and Bill and Melinda Gates and others who have mobilized around um, buying vaccines um, at lower rates and then distributing them. There's some challenges, obviously, in, in the fact that not full, there's certainly not um, full allocation for what ministries need um, in terms of amount, even to cover the bare minimum of frontline workers. So globally, this has to be something that, that we are continuing to advocate for. Another big piece of this is obviously um, 
really focusing on waiving the intellectual property and uh, the TRIPS waiver so that we're able to produce vaccines, not just in the US, but in other places. So putting um, um, pressure on the pharmaceutical companies to enable that to happen, particularly with new technologies like mRNA vaccines. We really need to be able to produce this on the African continent, Latin American and other places uh, for us to be able to really have full coverage. Um, also, we're really um, in the US, when we were asked to work in the US around COVID, we took lessons learned from Haiti from doing the cholera vaccine, um, working in West Africa during Ebola, and then uh, many other public health um, efforts that are happening in our countries around the world. Um, and we took these lessons learned to apply to the US settings, which I think was surprising for some people, but we knew, as all of you know who are on this panel, that certainly public health expertise sits oftentimes not in the US. Um, and that's where we need to be able to learn from. And we were really happy to be able to take the expertise from our colleagues in Rwanda, Sierra Leone, Haiti, et cetera, to bring to the US. In the US, we're focused on vaccine justice because we know that um, the certain um, neighborhoods and cer certain areas and certain um, um, underserved populations have disproportionately been impacted by COVID. And we know that that will follow through certainly as well with uh, vaccine access. We also focused on comprehensive public health and then the, the really push of enduring long-term public health. Um, and to illustrate how we've done this in, in collaboration with our communities, I'm gonna focus on three of the communities that we've been working with since May of this um, past year. You can go to the next slide. So partnering with local governments is what we do around the world and certainly has to happen here. You know, public health is local health um, and that's certainly people who know the context best are those who will, who will be best able to come up with the strategies that will work. Um, expanding communications, obviously, and this has been talked about a lot today, but really the best messengers are those who are from those communities. And then really connecting the vaccination rollout um, with other efforts that are embedded in these communities is, has really been critical. Um, it's, it's clear that, that it's, uh, we need to be able to be advocating for quality healthcare all of the time, not just during certainly a, a pandemic like COVID. And we're, we're seeing the, the repeated um, impact of um, you know, under-resourcing of healthcare in communities and in countries around the world that just gets illuminated during times like COVID. Our um, comprehensive public health approach, which we do globally and certainly did here as well, is you know honesty and really, and I know many speakers have talked about this as well, but answering questions about the vaccine in a really honest up, upfront way of what we know and what we don't know, um, and not just the you need to take it um, uh, kind of verbiage that I think has been around for a while with all a lot of public health interventions and really listening to the needs uh, to the community about um, the vaccine may not be their biggest pressing issue that they want addressed. So we have to be able to look at larger issues that are impacting people's day to day. And then connecting the vaccine to healthcare and social services. So part of what we infused into our contact tracing program, um, certainly in Massachusetts and in other places, just as we do in Sierra Leone and Rwanda, Liberia, et cetera, is connecting it to much needed social services for the most vulnerable. So looking at, um, do people have access to food? Are people able to isolate a quarantine safely and not in a, a household with many other people? And addressing these things up front and being embedded in these communities um, also enables us to be more effective vaccine um, ambassadors. Um, and then enduring public health, and we need to prioritize the needs of the marginalized and in the US public health system, for example, uh, it's for decades, public health has been under-resourced. And I think it's 30% of, of healthcare jobs over the past decade have been cut. 
So we're then in, in times like this, when we really need a strong foundational public health system, the US response to this pandemic has been poor as we all have seen. And pieces of that certainly um, are, are through many different layers, um, but our lack of a strong, robust invested in public health system, I think is a big piece of that. Next slide. So our public health accompaniment unit, again, we just formed in, in uh, May of last year, thinking it would be a short term and obviously is still ongoing. And these are the places on the map you can see in which we're working, very different in different places. Massachusetts, we've been part of the governor's effort and, and launched a, a huge contact tracing initiative, thousands of employees, et cetera, as one arm of Governor Baker's response. But in all these other places in the US, we really approached it just as we do on our global work of accompaniment of what is needed. Newark, New, Jer New Jersey needed things really differently than Immokalee, Florida, than Chicago, Illinois, et cetera. And it really looked different in different places based on what the identified needs were in those um, specific geographies. Next slide. So Immokalee, Florida, which is a migrant farm community in Florida, it was, it was clear that um, there was a, not a lot of trust within that community with the local clinics and public health systems. So we worked really hard to have actually boots on the ground and, and work within those clinics and public health departments on um, having community health workers um, be connected to those in the community. And this was really clear during vaccination when the, one of the first vaccination sites happened in Immokalee. Um, the vast majority, and there were pictures, as you can see in one of these um, on the slide of the first uh, vaccine effort, there was nobody or very few people from the Immokalee community. It was people from all over Florida who drove there and were able to access, it, but it actually did not serve the purpose of serving the people of Immokalee. So we worked very closely with the community, leveraging community partners, and the next vaccination event um, was definitely much more successful. And tangibly what we did was canvassing the community in advance and identifying those who were it fit the criteria at that point over 65. We um, reviewed patient registrars with community workers and did specific outreach. We did local messaging, tailoring of message to that community. Um, and um, promoted the connection to social supports that if people were um, had other needs, they would also be able to be looked at and addressed at this vaccine pop-up. And the follow-up event was much more successful because it was grounded in the community and the needs and the people of Immokalee were actually um, vaccinated, not necessarily everybody from all over Florida. Next slide. This, um, oops, I is this the next one or is Montgomery the next one? Yeah, thanks. So Montgomery, Alabama was another place and we really looked at vaccine hesitancy. And with all of these places we were asked to come into, we partnered with local boards of health, the mayor's office, departments of public health, depended on, on who asked us to come in and help. And we worked really closely with the mayor's office, which was very um, motivated and wanted to really help their um, uh, people of their community. And one of the things we looked at was vaccine hesitancy. And in Montgomery is 60% of black community and 20% of people in Montgomery fall below the um, federal poverty line. The hesitancy was high in this group um, and focus groups at this point looked at about one in six of the low income of black and Latinx residents said they would definitely get the COVID vaccine. Um, you know, this is morphing every day and there's, there's certainly more and more people who are um, uh, agreeing and wanting to get the vaccine. But we also uh, were surprised that 50% also of healthcare workers expressed reluctance. And so um, we really worked with the mayor's office and had a multi-channel public awareness and engagement campaign that communicated key messages with public um, health prevention, addressed questions, concerns, and again, really had trusted ambassadors from that community being out and, and going out and talking to people and addressing what their concerns were. I think this, you know, every place has had to have a very targeted specific outreach, again, done by people from those communities who have the best 
um, insight into what's needed. Next slide. Chicago is, is a, um, another place where was really interesting and we partnered with local community-based organizations on a vaccine core partnership. And this really looked at identifying, uh, mobilizing trusted messengers within those communities who are part of these different community-based organizations. And then that group um, constructed a communication and education campaign and really looked at designing a long-term model for community-led development, which is key certainly for all of this. Um, the coordination of messaging across institutions was critical. We know that throughout the US that there's been messaging from different institutions of whether it's at a pharmacy or a hospital, local clinic, pop-up clinic of where these vaccinations take place. And the goal was that all of this messaging was aligned so there wasn't confusion and really creating a mechanism to share learnings and insights and bringing, bringing visibility to what um, transparency is needed. And there was cross sharing and this still continues today. And what we did in this effort, because there's phenomenal leaders there, is we, play, we played the role of um, implementing designing governance process for this group, um, ensured um, appropriate um, representation to make sure and digging deep into the hardest, hardest communities, and then did local partnership um, uh, coordination. Next slide. So our, our goal is, is really that we want, we are advocating for a long-term enduring comprehensive public health for the future, not just during a pandemic. And we think just as in other parts of the world, community health workers are key to this. Um, and we need to have care embedded into the community in, our, in a long-term process um, and not just during the times of a pandemic. Next slide. So in, in kind of summary, I think the lessons learned globally to the multi multitude of US settings really um, uh, were founded on that we need to have a, a, a long-term strategy that, that is not just revolving around giving a vaccine, but is around providing public health and um, comprehensive health services that are rooted in the community and also provide much needed social support systems so that we're, we're addressing all of people's needs, not just um, the ones that is, is being pushed on them at this point, which is vaccination. Thank you. So thank you very much uh, to you, Sheila. Um, you, you hit on the right points uh, around sustainability when it comes to um, public health interventions. Um, we historically have gone through boom and bust, panic and neglect cycles. Uh, and when the problem is over, then we lower our guard. And it's fundamentally important for us to have sustainable interventions uh, clearly. And secondly, the emphasis on the resilience. Um, it's pandemic response is important because that takes a particular machinery, but clearly what's required um, is something that uh, that goes beyond that. Um, and so, and that means the resilience of the overall system. So thank you very much for that. Um, all the presentations are so fascinating. We sort of really unhappy about having to, to confine ourselves to the time that we have. So I'm going to now hand over to to Richard to make comments. And after his comments, we'll have a few minutes um, to respond to a question or two. Uh, and we have to move on to the next se session at 11.15. So over to you, Richard. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, a daunting task to comment on these several presentations. The, 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 the part that's so impressive is people doing the work than talking about it, as opposed to what often happens in conferences that great thinkers talk about things that they're not actually doing. Here we have a very different situation. Um, I am impressed mainly with two things from the, from the previous comments as additional points. Uh, one is that the things that people are talking about, what we haven't talked about that much is who do we have to do these things? Who can we uh, reach to carry out these activities? Uh, each of these groups have had uh, implied uh, the people that they had. And I'm glad that the Federation of Red Cross was taking part because if no one else in areas that are unstable, there is almost always some presence of the International Federation, or local 
Red Cross Association in a country um, who we at CDC have often found to be um, our best last mile uh, participants. Um, the comments in the United, about the United States also um, make me think about the, the, the positive um, aspect that's occurred recently in the United States where the um, uh, either having had the vaccine or intending to take the vaccine, the gap between African-American and white people in the last six weeks has greatly decreased. That is to say, in both groups, there is an increased uh, interest in vaccine as people become more familiar with it, but that the major changes occurred among African-Americans. And I think this is because there has been such an active effort to recruit religious leaders, um, popular personalities, even rap artists to communicate uh, as people receive information from various multiple sources, some of it technically trusted and some of it socially trusted. Um, we are experiencing a positive thing here that um, all of us can learn from that. Uh, it can't only be from one source. It has to be from multiple sources. And our best sources are first talking to people to find out who they trust and where information uh, can come from. What I haven't heard is about what I might call, if I was in the business of selling something, market segmentation. Because we've talked about communities, but communities are not uniform uh, um, entities. There are early adapters, uh, people who are in heavier information streams, both in the positive and negative side uh, for vaccine hesitancy. There is a larger usually group of people who are wait and see and possibly be interested. And there is a group of resistors uh, um, or, or, or um, people who, who see themselves as independent against a stream. Um, the size of those groups and the nature of those groups is very different in different countries, different, different cultural environments. Um, we've been working a lot in Navajo uh, nation in the United States. And actually, resistors are almost non-existent there. Vaccine acceptance in Native communities in the United States and some of the areas is already at 95%, I mean, having had vaccine. Uh, so we've gone from several hundred cases a day to three days last week with not a single case. Um, but that means working with communities enough to know the different components of communities and the ways to reach them. Um, finally, because we have so little time, I get the opportunity to not speak that much. Um, I want to make us think going forward about what will hopefully be a good problem of imbalance between access to vaccine and demand for vaccine. Because hesitancy is not only about fear or uh, rumors, it's also frustration of availability. Vaccine will become more available slowly in many of the poorest and unstable areas of the world. And it's probably going to be several years before everybody who wants this vaccine will have access to it. And so there will be moments of imbalance that we've experienced in the United States in a small way, which is likely to be much larger in some unstable areas, which might be the last areas to get vaccine, where there are many people who want it and have trouble getting it. Um, and so we're already seeing in some countries fake vaccine adding to the problems and confusions um, as people take advantage of that imbalance. That imbalance will be a leapfrogging situation where we have to catch up to demand. And then as, as things evolve, demand will grow again and new leaps will have to occur. Um, and it's a sobering situation because unlike polio, which is very easy with an oral presentation. Um, there is more logistics involved in providing this vaccine. There are some of the, the, the um, low income and complex emergency areas of the world where we have never had more than 80% of target population vaccinated for measles. So we will, we will have great challenges that we will have to find new ways to reach people. As many people have been saying in this meeting, not only on this vaccine, but to make sure we have catch up where vaccine declined in past years and move forward to have high levels of vaccine availability for all the things that people need. That's it from me.
and a, a few perspectives from our work in, in the Centers for Disease Control in the United States. Thanks very much. Thank you, Richard. Uh, and uh, I am back, the, the, the trial vials of internet. And uh, Richard is, uh, as he said at the end, he's uh, um, with US CDC, has been a longtime colleague at the Columbia University School of Nursing and instrumental in bringing a global health equity perspective to nursing education um, for many years. So thank you, Richard. We I, I wanna say one more word then, that many of the speakers today are nurses, including well, myself. I, yes. And um, when we're talking about trusted community members, um, people who need the information so that they're giving good information, nursing staff reach into many areas where other people don't. Um, nursing is often the silent backbone of societies and, and uh, we shouldn't forget that. Well, thank you. And that was gonna be my question to you and Sheila since we, we have worked together through decades and many, many pandemics and crises before and uh, truly um, remarkable to have both of you here and acknowledge and, uh, and the, the role that nurses play. We have five minutes for questions. So I'm really asking one specific one to uh, St uh, Stefano, could you give a one minute answer of what contributed to make one volunteer in every street initiative successful? One minute, thank you, Stefano. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, yeah, this initiative was particularly successful because it really relied on communities, on uh, access to community through members of the other communities. So the message was much easier to convey to the, to the population, to the, to the wider population, and especially the vulnerable categories. Uh, talking about the vulnerable categories in particular, I believe that th these people might not have access to the uh, tr uh, traditional media channel of communication, TVs in some cases, also social media. So the door-to-door -door access and approach was uh, helping in uh, reaching out to them. There were also other barriers, for example, in terms of uh, language barrier. So in the case of migrants, and uh, there are 700,000 migrants in, uh, in media, this approach going to visit the Buddha, this uh, vulnerable individual really helped uh, in uh, reaching them out, explaining the key messages and uh, avoid any rumors, misinformation, uh, misunderstanding and a better access to the health facilities. Over to you, Jennifer. Thank you, perfect. Thank you so much. Chinwei, one minute. Can you talk a little bit about um, a best example of what you saw, have seen work in your strategies uh, with focus on the use of jingles, which you have described to me, and the multi-stakeholder risk communication platform? Yes, um, that, that is a very good example, Jennifer. We try to play back the jingles to the communities, uh, the target communities, to get their feedback from it. Um, we use that in Lagos, and um, we had focus group discussions and what we call audio diagnosis, where we present this information, education, communication materials to the community and then get their feedback and their input. Uh, one key thing that came out of that, it was based on that strategy that we identified the use of uh, uh, horizontal stretched out arms to depict uh, two meters uh, distance. So, and that was very effective. A poll that uh, was conducted last year in Lagos showed that over two weeks, after two weeks of implementing this intervention in that state, there was a 22% increase in the proportion of the population that considered COVID-19 to be real and no longer a hoax. So we think that is what, of course, the multi-stakeholder platform, we have a national risk communication technical working group comprising of all the relevant uh, stakeholders across the various sectors. And they are currently developing a multi-hazard risk communication plan for the country. Thank you. Thank you, Chinwei. And to you, Sheila, one, one minute. I don't, I missed most of your remarks, but I do know, um, I want to note that you were um, the leadership in Partners in Health during the Ebola response and uh, as a nurse really paved, uh, broke many glass ceilings. So thank you. One, one word about your view about nursing's role is, is primary or central uh, risk communicators? 
Yeah, thanks, Jennifer. You know, definitely our my big push and our big push has always been those closest to the issue, to the people, to whatever is happening should should have the most say in in what is um, what the the plan is. So, you know, in most of the places we work around the world and in the U.S. settings, nurses are the trusted advisor and the people who the people who are are connected and embedded in the into the communities. So, I think highlight and um, uh, for all levels of the organization, acknowledging that and highlighting and illuminating that a lot of the leaders are nurses is critical for so that we can continue to move nurses up within an organization so they're permanently at decision-making tables and not just sporadically during um, outbreaks and things like that, I think will be the key for longer term, more sustained and more effective efforts globally. Thank you. And last question to you, Richard. There's a question in the uh, box about um, um, question and answer. Do you have any studies to point us to the effect of Israeli occupation and apartheid on the Palestinian population? Any estimate on the reparations that the Israel apartheid should pay on Palestinians? One minute, and then we will conclude. This is not a one minute question. That's why uh, I can answer another way, <laughs> but I do want to highlight the question. Yeah. Um, there are there is good data on health status in uh, occupied areas, um, and because of uh, Palestinian Minister of Health, which has long done good monitoring. Um, the effect of occupation, though, is a long chain of events with multiple inputs, and so that's where there's a lot of um, analytical and um, um, uh, research-related activities, much of this has been published by Palestinian groups, um, and much of it has been in the Lancet. Um, on the question of reparations, I'm not familiar with information on that. Okay, thank you. Uh, and there's, uh, we will hand it over now. There's one question Question that a panelist might uh, answer on, on uh, the issue of conscription during pandemics of healthcare workers. And over to Wilmot for our next main speaker. Um, thank you very much, Jennifer, and thank you for um, for being able to uh, join us again. We uh, we're very pleased that the internet is functional again. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for the fabulous uh, session. If I can now uh, hand over to Victoria Razna, who is one of our key partners uh, in this uh, effort of ours, and she is a, a dean in um, the School of General Studies at Columbia. And she also um, is a professor of English. Victoria. Hi, everyone. Um, so, such a fascinating discussion. Uh, and um, really, really interested to comment when I have a little bit more time at the end about some of the things we're discussing about the role of nurses in pandemic response. Um, but for now, I want to say how delighted we are to have Belinda Frost joining us to deliver um, the third and final keynote of today's event. Um, I, you know, she is the perfect person um, to speak to us on these topics um, and uh, joins us as the technical officer and risk communication and community engagement lead for the World Health Organization, uh, having worked in the field for more than 25 years. I'll mention him just in particular that she served as the Director for Emergency Risk Communication for the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Beijing, China for six years and developed and led new communications programs from the agency headquarters for more than 10 years. Uh, so I'm very much looking forward to her remarks today and we'll turn it over to her. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, I did, uh, I, had, I have a presentation. I hope that's uh, okay with everybody. I'll go ahead and try to share. <laughs> Okay, great. Well, thank you for having me today. It's really a pleasure to, to be part of this, uh, this presentation and this session today. So I um, just want to present uh, some of the work that we've been doing at the World Health Organization around COVID-19. It's been quite a year and uh, quite a journey for us as an organization. Um, but I'll, I'll just take a couple minutes to talk about some of the major areas of activity. As everybody probably has mentioned today, we've really focused a lot of our the typical factors of um, emergency risk communications, that's public perception, uncertainty, um, certainly gaining trust 
with our um, stakeholders and our populations. And I will say that maybe a little atypically from past um, responses from WHO is that we've tried more than ever to actually communicate with individuals kind of from the global level. That's um, uh, not so much really been the, 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 the focus of previous emergencies from WHO. So we've really tried to do this not an easy task. And I'll explain a little bit about how hopefully we've been able to do that somewhat effectively over the course of the year. Um, just as a bit of background from where we've come from and why we've had such a focus around risk communication and community engagement is a major pillar of our work. It started in, in around 2005, 2006 after the SARS outbreak when we realized that um, member states and countries really needed to have a focus on how to better communicate with their populations during it began there, and we were really able to begin to work more and more with member states on how to improve this critical area of the response, um, of any emergency response. So it's one of the key uh, pillars under the international health regulations. I suspect that this may change a little bit after COVID-19, but this area will probably only grow and probably only strengthen us again and again and again. We keep learning the same lesson about how critical this part of the response really is. Um, many of you may be aware of this, that part of what we were doing with member states to help grow um, this area was to um, work within the international health regulations and build out this area. And I just showed a, a slide that was part of a, what's called a joint external evaluation where countries could evaluate themselves on a couple different components of emergency risk communications. And it includes community engagement, includes rumors management, misperceptions, it includes public communication with mass and social media, it includes partner coordination so that you're able to align the many voices that are coming forward and speaking during an emergency. And of course, just simply the system itself, making sure you have enough staff to address this area, that they're well trained and integrated into the emergency response, that they're sitting at the table in the incident management system. And I think we're seeing that now more than we have in past emergencies. The next thing that came along in terms of WHO's focus in this area was the, PIP, the pandemic influenza preparedness framework. Again, a strong focus around risk communication and community engagement, which better enabled us to build more and more capacity uh, for member states in this area. And now that brings us to now, 2020, 2021, with the COVID-19 response. And there's no doubt that this area is growing in new ways. We're learning, again, the same lessons that we've learned again and again, how important and critically important uh, community engagement and community-centered approaches really are. But then also learning a whole new area of work around uh, what we're calling infodemics from uh, WHO. It's the overwhelming amount of information both online and offline that's making it really difficult for individuals to make informed decisions about their health and their well-being we use a standard approach of you know awareness to action and that's what we've been looking at throughout our response as well you know from the global level we've often felt like the most we could really do is simply give an awareness of a background of information but now we're trying to gear more of our communications even at the global level around awareness of a solution and trying to present a lot of the work we do in scenarios, uh, common scenarios that anybody might face um, in their day-to-day -day lives, how to go to a doctor's office safely, how to do your, your grocery or your market shopping safely, how to do these things in the context of COVID-19. And now getting over to the informed um, decisions and actions, which again is gearing more towards our community engagement side of things. So how do we do this uh, if I'm at the global level of, of, uh, of WHO, the World Health Organization? And so when we think about communication, that's a difficult thing, right? Who am I communicating with? Am I talking to that grandmother in Costa Rica? Am I talking to that 15-year-old in Kenya? Am I talking to that woman who's the same age as I am, has two kids <laughs> that's, uh, you know, working in, in Thailand full time. So it's, you know, we're trying to, of course, trying to as much address global audiences as we can, but we really, really depend upon our regional office to further contextualize thing, things, get them into different languages and not just, you know, spoken language, but actually the words and the terms that individuals are using. I've just taken this quick snapshot of all the work our regions are doing. This is just as of last week, their focus area. And you can kind of see that the bend towards 
where they're putting their energies on these days, a lot of vaccine efforts and vaccine around healthcare workers and campaigns and so on. Just a quick overview, um, I would say the first six months of the COVID-19 response around this area, of course, we had the typical challenges not typical, well, I mean typical in that I'm sure everybody here has faced the same challenges, you know, how do we communicate transmission? What are the symptoms? Who is this affecting? Who are the risk groups? And the uh, communications needs at that point we found are really focused on information that was needed as soon as possible. And then really we put a lot of effort into um, combating myths. I think you might be familiar with our myth busting series because in the beginning there were so many myths. Um, it was pretty easy to identify and identify them and address them. Now, not so much, which I take as a good sign. However, things are becoming more nuanced and more difficult in some ways. So a lot of output in our outcomes. I would say the second six months of the response for the second half of last year really dealt more with challenges of individuals and being a bit more confused because again, there was so much information. There were lots of information was coming from different sources, some typically trusted sources, some not so much. Um, and people were really beginning to have fatigue um, with just the basic pre prevention measures, which of course we still know will work <laughs> and still need to be used even with a vaccine um, and just trying to find new and different ways of presenting that information. So we really had to more um, contextualize our information and more individualize some of the approaches that we were trying to use. We did more interactive um, content quizzes, things like that, that were a bit more fun and engaged individuals, allowing them to be presented with a scenario, make a choice, find out whether or not that was riskier or not riskier. And then again, really working with some key amplification networks and, and allowing those networks to kind of really be a trusted source of information. We're doing a lot of work around with faith-based organizations, work with um, business sectors so that they can be a good conduit of information from employer to employee. And then also with the youth um, uh, engagement, which has been quite fun as well. So say, um, just some of the communications we're doing around vaccine in the early phase was to prepare um, the public and countries for the onset of vaccine rollout and to explain how vaccines get developed, why they were getting developed so quickly, why they were getting developed, but still in a very safe manner. So we have a whole vaccine explainer series just to give individuals the background of that. In the second phase, we really began to work more towards explaining the evolving science of vaccines. So you can see a lot of this in a series we call Science in Five, where we just take five minutes to interview an expert in the area and just answer some of the key questions that we see that are popping up through some of our Google ads and things like that. So we can address current needs very quickly with a somewhat uh, more engaging type of communication. Um, and now we're beginning to address a couple more things in terms of specific issues and what is known and what is not known. A good example of that right now um, is the vaccine and how variants of concern are going to affect vaccine um, efficacy going forward. Um, so we're dealing with a lot of changing science. It's been the number one <laughs> stressor in my life over the course of this past year, 15 months, I guess we're at. Um, and so it's really uh, pushed us to make sure that we're up to date on the science and that, that we're very careful with what we say. We want to make sure that we have a, you know, we're really reporting on the latest science. And I could go into detail about shows process of reviewing science and get, gathering together a global perspective of what that science is, but that would be a whole other presentation. So we just try to make sure at least our communication side is date stamped because these things are likely to change and that we've set it in a way that allows there to be some change later, but is not so um, emphasizing the uncertainty because we're finding that that is actually um, causing a little bit of an issue in terms of people being able to trust science when we're saying so openly that it's a bit uncertain these days. So I just thought I'd do a quick snapshot on where we're at, um, just using the AstraZeneca vaccine as a um, as an example. So we've done a lot of work around how vaccines are developed. We update Q and A's just to get rapid information out. A very scientific documentation about interim recommendations that are in, you know, Times New Roman 12 point font, boring, boring, boring. <laughs> and then as well as statements coming from our other organizations that help us determine 
um, where we're at with vaccines. But you can see lately the news media is coming, um, you know, there's a lot of news media around AstraZeneca. When there were first questions about this a couple of weeks ago, we what we tried to do was push out some um, information about how vaccines were developed, what is the safe vaccine safety process, what happens when we have an adverse event following immunization, what is that process like? Um, so as soon as there were questions out there, we began to push this information out through all of our regional offices to make sure that as questions arose, we could almost pre-bunk on a global level any questions around uh, vaccine safety for all of the other vaccines. So we're trying to kind of get this drumbeat of getting um, positive information out there, good information, scientific information to help pre-bunk some questions and concerns that may come down the line. Um, as I think my uh, our CDC colleague earlier mentioned too, we're very much trying to tap these influencer networks and healthcare workers are chief among them, globally seen as one of the most trusted sources of information. So we're getting more and more uh, uh, communications intended for healthcare workers to be able to use, to talk individuals through that vaccine process, to answer their questions in a very respectful manner. We, what we know is that when it comes to hesitancy, Hesitancy isn't, you know, people really questioning the vaccine. They actually have very valid um, questions that they just simply need an answer to. They need information more than they're necessarily doubting safety of vaccine and so on. Um, just quickly, uh, more now than ever, we have more social listening data um, that helps us, provides us a, a little bit clearer vision on what we're working with in terms of people's questions and concerns. We do sentiment analysis. Um, this is, of course, all through certain social media, mostly Twitter. So you realize how um, that doesn't give us a full picture globally. It gives us a bit of a snapshot for some certain populations. And we try to marry this uh, information with other information that we have coming in, common questions, concerns. We look at our social and behavioral data that we have coming up through some of our community engagement, mostly partnerships with other organizations like UNICEF and International Federation of the Red Cross and, and, and dozens of others doing this work on ground. So just more insight through social listening techniques. I will say that WHO has a new program called EARS. It's the Early AI Supported Response with Social Listening. And it's a country-based tool that allows countries to scan social media, open source stuff, to find out where uh, questions are, what the concerns are. Soon this is going to give us more data and, and countries will be able to overlap other sort of epidemiologic data, social science and behavioral data to give a fuller picture on what's going on inside their country. So we can give more information about that. This is one snapshot of this and it's just showing uh, that actually this happened to just be in Africa, which appropriate for today's um, presentation, that this region more than any others are really having a lot of questions around the COVID-19 vaccine. This, by the way, this is, uh, this platform is currently live in about 23 different countries, but we're trying to expand from there. So just on the other side of the spectrum, since we know that approximately 50% of the world's population doesn't have access to smartphones. So there's the digitally poor out there that we make sure that we want to make sure that we're hitting with information as well in a trusted environment that will help it uh, resonate with them and make this relevant. So we have a new um, package called the 10 steps to community readiness and it's a step by step process. We have a website that gives lots of different tools for community engagement professionals to be able to reach out to populations to get more towards a community um, focused approach, but more importantly, a community led response um, as part of COVID-19. And then the important uh, rolling out of a lot of these um, uh, vaccines and diagnostics and tests so that communities will accept them when they come. Hate to have such a huge expensive, uh, you know, effort put forward like this without communities wanting to accept them. Just touching on the specific work of some of my colleagues in the Africa region, since I'm speaking more at a global level, we have a new um, a new uh, alliance there called the Africa Infodemic Response Alliance. You'll remember earlier I touched on infodemic, which we at WHO refer to as the overwhelming amount of information, making it difficult for individuals to find the information they need to make informed decisions about their health and well-being. 
and we really focus on the um, public health event era out outbreaks of disease and so on. So through this um, alliance, it's really addressing um, an uh, it's a network that's really addressing health misinformation and in, um, information gaps. And they have a function called Viral Facts Africa, which debunks a myth and going on. So I hope that maybe you're all taking advantage of this in the region. Um, it's quite an interesting project. Um, in terms of vaccine rollout, uh, 44 countries have received 29 million COVID-19 uh, vaccines. Uh, there's some challenges in terms of a limited supply um, and then some also uh, vaccine safety monitoring network is going on. Um, some successes are that in general, there's been effective communication at vaccination sites with beneficiaries. So get, again, getting messages out through healthcare workers that are the shot givers giving these things. They're using innovative campaigns um, from digital tools to influencers to opinion leaders. And there's strong support from key opinion leaders and heads of state publicly about the vaccination there's some challenges there too. Um, limited supply, balancing vaccine eagerness with lack of availability, um, and then other influenced by international vaccine crisis such as the AstraZeneca issues um, in Europe. Quickly, I wanted to just touch on um, vaccine confidence and uptake and how we look at that at WHO. From this, I'm using some of the work of a colleague of mine, Lisa Menning. And, and it's just important to note that and you may have touched on this earlier too, that when we think about vaccine confidence, vaccine hesitancy related issues, there's a lot of different um, perspectives that come into, the, in, into this decision-making process for the individuals. It's, it's not just necessarily what they think about the vaccine itself or confidence or safety issues. There's a lot of just social processing that goes on, the influence of other individuals in their lives, what are the vaccination norms of the community and of the area? Um, just, just trust in the vaccine providers. And then maybe even in terms of healthcare workers, which are the, the, the starred ones here, um, what are the perceiv perceived risks coming from other individuals or organizations? What are the workplace norms uh, when it comes to vaccination? Are there other healthcare workers that maybe, because there are some healthcare worker confidence issues, are there other healthcare workers that, that do or don't believe that in the efficacy of the vaccine? Um, what are their self-confidence issues in being able to answer questions from, uh, from the vaccinee? So um, lots of need for support for healthcare workers, both in terms of their questioning of vaccines, but their ability to be able to answer questions. There's lots of issues around motivation. There's an intention to get a vaccine. And then just very practical issues too that come into play ease of access, preferred site or location, knowing even where to get the vaccine, um, and then just, uh, you know, maybe even for the adult population, previous uptake of the vaccine. So lots of different components are coming into individuals' decisions to get vaccinated, not just purely um, questioning the vaccine. The fortunate thing is that largely what we're seeing in the data is that um, you know, there's been an increase in confidence and willingness to take the vaccine compared from December to what we're kind of seeing these days. So that's swinging in the right direction. Of course, this could always change. So we're keeping our eye on this a lot. But it is showing that that in terms of hesitancy, it's not necessarily having to do with public buy-in or the, the conspiracy theory or anything. We, we believe it really did come from people's people, individuals needing to have answers for their question, needing to know more about it in order to make the right decision. Other strategies that we use and promote are basic education campaigns, which give individuals more information, having on-site vaccination, incentives to do so, um, free, make them free and affordable, um, institutional recommendations, whether it's at the workplace or so on, having a provider recommendation, reminders and recalls and so on, the way you frame your messaging you know, when an individual comes in, are you saying, do you want the vaccine today? Which may present more of a question in the mind of the vaccinee. Or are you saying, oh, you're here to get your COVID-19 vaccine. That's great to see you. Um, and then other vaccine champions. So lots of different ways to um, ensure that vaccinees get their uh, get their questions answered and, uh, and lean towards getting vaccinated. So um, just this is the whole spectrum of where people lie in terms of when it comes to vaccine hesitancy. You have the um, 
activist, you have somebody who will not, you know, is not going to get vaccinated, individuals that are just rejecting it. Those that are on the fence and may need more information or just a little guidance, always good for healthcare workers to know what questions and which angle or concerns are people coming to the vaccination site with and how to communicate and answer questions around those concerns. Accepting, demanding, and then advocating over here. We have lots of unfortunate misinformation about vaccinations and misinformation about COVID-19. So a lot of what we're talking about is how to pre-bunk those myths ahead of time at the, at the national and community level before um, individuals may hear that. So we're preparing what we call a truth sandwich uh, for, for uh, communities to be able to use. We say, you know, you may be hearing this, uh, first you say the truth. Um, this is the fact about vaccinations. You may be hearing this particular myth be forewarned. It's gonna be a myth. And then again, repeat with the truth at the end. So just in trying to use trusted um, individuals and organizations to get that information out. So just a lot of um, you know preparing and planning for the individuals um, at the sites and how to deal with the adverse event following immunization and just to build resiliency um, across the different components of the vaccination world to ensure that we are engaging uh, communities and religious groups and healthcare workers, all of those influencers, building a public understanding of the importance of vaccine and then just ensuring uh, quality services. I think that's about it for me. Uh, so. Melinda, thank you so much for your remarks. Um, really fascinating. And I especially appreciate um, your focusing on the, you know, the, the many moments in the messaging process around vaccine uptake um, and taking them apart. And in particular, your focus just on the, the idea of hesitation um, and to understand that as, you know, not a, not a moment of stubbornness, not a moment of blind fear or panic, but a, a moment of consideration and thought and individuals really kind of um, looking for the information that they need to make considered and thoughtful decisions about their health. Um, so I, I really appreciate the time you took to sort of unpack that. <clears throat> as well as the need to um, continually evolve um, messaging as the pandemic continues to, to morph and shift and we have tools like the vaccine available um, for public health measures. Um, so thank you so much for your Thanks for the time. Uh, I'm gonna shift to introducing the last panel of this morning's event uh, on crisis communications and vaccine uptake. Um, we're gonna turn to journalism now uh, and by way of introducing the panel, I just want to say a couple of words about the overall program trajectory and why we're ending up where we are. Um, the design of today's program, as you probably noticed, began at the scale of the individual health citizen, expanded in the second panel to the role of the community, and now with our final panel is going to expand further outwards to the broader public sphere. All these levels of engagement are obviously interreliant. All are focused on individuals and communities who everywhere in the world today are making decisions on a daily basis about how to contend with the COVID-19 pandemic. We all know that during a worldwide health emergency, there is broad reliance on journalistic accounts, uh, especially in parts of the world that do have ready access um, to public media. And so these figure prominently in any plan for risk communications. We've heard today a lot about the current climate of misinformation and distrust that we have to combat and journalism has a key role to play here as well. Um, Wilmot also spoke earlier about the exact factors that hold communities of individuals or can hold them back from making the choice to be vaccinated. And journalists, of course, are in some ways professional persuaders. Uh, and can offer tools to support health citizens making informed, confident decisions about their health. Our, spe our two speakers today will offer perspectives from the interconnected worlds of journalism and activism. And I hope we will talk about that, that nexus. Both Madeline and Mark have spent their careers in thinking about what journalism can contribute to the work of making equitable access to healthcare a human right. 
their remarks, I think, I hope, will dramatize the ethical role that journalism can play in creating sound risk communications, in supporting vaccine uptake, and in building, and in some cases, repairing public trust. Uh, I'll first briefly introduce Madeline Drexler, who is a visiting scientist at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Her work is familiar to you if you read publications like the New York Times, The Nation, and The Atlantic. Her recent feature story in the latter periodical showcased how a small, relatively poor nation with a porous border has managed to mount one of the world's most successful COVID response efforts. Uh, her talk today is Pandemic Response and Risk Communication, Lessons from Bhutan, and I will turn it over now to Madeline. Thank you. Well, thank you, Victoria, uh, and thank you for inviting me to this meeting. I've been uh, taking notes all morning long, and I've learned a lot, so I appreciate it. Um, as Victoria mentioned, I'm going to talk about a, a pandemic response that's um, a bit of a counterpoint to some of the uh, challenging experiences that we've heard about today. Uh, this is the Himalayan nation of Bhutan, which has actually seen only one death so far from COVID-19. And that death didn't happen until uh, this past January. Uh, Bhutan has also stamped out all community transmission in the country. Right now, there are only uh, four active cases of coronavirus infection. And uh, last month I, I published a piece in the Atlantic that examined uh, how Bhutan was able to manage this uh, amazing feat. And uh, one of the key factors in its success was astute risk communications from the government and from the monarchy. And actually listening to the presentations today, I, I realized that uh, many of the things that uh, Bhutan did right uh, has mirrored the best, best practices that have been described so far this morning. So just to give you some uh, background, uh, some perspective on Bhutan, Bhutan uh, may be best known for its, its guiding policy of gross national happiness, but it is still a, a poor country. It's on the UN's list of least developed countries. And when the pandemic began, it had only 337 physicians in the entire country. And it had just, uh, just one PCR machine. So uh, also, as Victoria mentioned, while Bhutan may seem uh, isolated in terms of geography, it, it does share this long porous border with India, which uh, as you know, has been a hotspot. So one advantage that Bhutan did have uh, was a public health focus on prevention, which uh, all low and middle income countries have no choice but to adopt because uh, a runaway pandemic would, would overwhelm their, their health facilities. Uh, and for years before uh, coronavirus emerged, uh, Bhutan had been beefing up its pandemic response. So Bhutan's first case of COVID-19 showed up in March of last year uh, in an American tourist, you know, what else? Uh, but the country acted very quickly. Uh, it barred all tourists, it closed all public institutions, uh, it relentlessly called for face masks and hand hygiene and social distancing. And just as, uh, as important, the, the prime minister and the middle, minister of health started holding daily press conferences where they both appeared to share um, updates on the situation. The Ministry of Health also started posting uh, statements on social media that corrected disinformation that was appearing on blogs and on social media. So right after uh, WHO declared COVID-19 a pandemic, also last March, Bhutan launched this massive uh, uh, testing and contact tracing program that continues to today. It also started mandatory quarantine uh, in government run facilities for all Bhutanese who were potentially exposed to the virus. 
And this included thousands of expatriates who were um, flown in on, on chartered flights. So the government underwrote every aspect of this, uh, of this quarantine. Uh, it put up people in uh, tourist level lodgings. It, um, it uh, provided free meals. It gave them free Wi-Fi. And so as much as possible, the government removed all inconveniences from the quarantine process. It also uh, provided psychological services, psychological support. So Bhutan is very uh, tightly knit country and in, in many respects, it's a traditional culture. Uh, what's impressive uh, to me about Bhutan's response is that it, it leveraged uh, social mores uh, cultural traditions, uh, Buddhist religion, to reinforce this message and to um, reinforce its actions. Uh, it staged this massive uh, uh, media campaign called Our, Our Gienku, which means our, our responsibility, uh, people's responsibility to break the chain in or break the chain of transmission in order to um, protect each other. And this campaign featured social influencers in Bhutan, like uh, artists, uh, bloggers, um, sports personalities, um, and, and actors. So in August, uh, when the first outbreak of community transmission was discovered, um, notable that community transmission didn't even start until August, uh, Bhutanese officials ordered this very strict uh, three-week lockdown. But leaders had been talking about this possibility, actually this um, uh, you know, almost inevitable possibility for months. So people were prepared for it. And leaders did everything they could to help Bhutanese uh, endure the lockdown. They delivered food and medicine and other essentials to every household in the nation, uh, which is a, an amazing accomplishment in, in a Himalayan nation. Uh, they sent special care packages to senior citizens. They set up shelters for victims of domestic violence, which was increasing in Bhutan as it was in many places. And the king even ordered uh, the Royal Bhutan Army to uh, feed stray dogs which was very much in line with the Buddhist idea of, of compassion. And e even in their own actions, uh, the leaders reinforced the concept of collective responsibility. So last spring, the king set up a relief fund for everybody who had lost his or her job. And that relief fund is still distributing money. Uh, the king uh, has quarantined himself after every trip around the country, also, you know, in, in order to model uh, good precautionary behavior. And during the national lockdowns, uh, the prime minister did not go home at the end of the day. He, he did not want to risk bringing the virus home to his, um, to his wife and kids. So he slept each night in a narrow window seat uh, in his government office. There was a, a picture of it in the newspaper, uh, the Bhutanese. Um, so the message from these leaders was, uh, we wouldn't ask you to do anything that we ourselves wouldn't do. Uh, we are all in this together. So uh, Bhutan's uh, astute way of communicating also um, extended to its vaccination rollout. Uh, it plans to give the first dose of the AstraZeneca vaccine to all eligible people in the country in just one week. Um, the rollout started actually this past Saturday, March 27th, and the vast majority of the Bhutanese have, have signed up. So we all know that there have been uh, publicized concerns about the vaccine. Uh, and the prime minister assured Bhutanese that if, uh, if health authorities discover any unexpected complications or side effects, that they would halt the vaccination campaign. So Bhutan has actually had the vaccine for a few months, uh, it was a gift from India, 
but leaders decided to wait and uh, consult with the central monastic body to figure out uh, an auspicious week uh, for the vaccination campaign to, to, to be launched, uh, auspicious according to the Buddhist lunar calendar. Uh, the monk body is very influential in Bhutan. So the monks said it would be auspicious uh, to start on March 27th and auspicious if a 30 year old woman who was born in the year of the monkey be the first Bhutanese to receive the vaccine. And that is exactly what happened in a ceremony this past uh, Saturday uh, after that woman was vaccinated and the prime minister and his family were vaccinated and the members of cabinet of the cabinet were vaccinated. And when uh, a few weeks ago, when um, uh, the vaccine shipments, the main vaccine shipments arrived from India, uh, the monastic leaders gathered at the international airport and they uh, intoned prayers to the medicine Buddha. Uh, they were cleansing uh, the vaccines of defilements according to the religion. So uh, I, I should also say that throughout this pandemic, the monastic leaders have strongly reinforced the public health messaging. So. When I was reporting this uh, piece in the Atlantic, I, I was very curious uh, and I asked the source, uh, how is it possible that uh, uh, the health leaders were uh, adhering to the most rigorous science, and, but also uh, to Buddhist astrology? I, I couldn't reconcile those two things. And I was told that Bhutan is a country that believes both in medical treatment and in divine intervention, and that there would be more uh, buy-in from the citizens if, uh, if religious tenets were followed. So uh, uh, echoing a lot of what has been um, described during these sessions, uh, throughout Bhutan's pandemic response, the element of trust has been paramount. Um, the young king in Bhutan carries a great moral authority. And uh, from the start, he told government officials that even one COVID-19 death in Bhutan would be one too much because this is a small nation that regards itself as family. And the government officials openly repeated the king's uh, admonitions to them. Um, the king traveled far and wide across the country to uh, personally uh, encourage the frontline workers and, and to ex express his gratitude. So speaking of trust, uh, there was great trust in the government officials themselves. Uh, the reason is the prime minister is a physician. Uh, the foreign minister is a physician. Uh, the minister of health is a, is a global epidemiologist, global health ep epidemiologist uh, who trained at, at Yale. Uh, the Minister of Finance is a, is a public health grad. So this was a leadership team that was very tuned to public health principles and whose judgments could be trusted. So uh, a journalist in Bhutan, very prominent named uh, Nam Gay Zam, she told me, I, I don't think any other country can say that leaders and ordinary people enjoy such mutual trust. This is the main reason for Bhutan's success. So uh, at this point in the pandemic, uh, Bhutanese are very proud that they, uh, you know, succeeded where the wealthy West failed. And uh, there's even a, a hint of smugness in their, in their attitude. Uh, on March 27th, uh, the first day of the vaccination campaign, the national newspaper Kunzel said in an editorial, in our fight against COVID-19, we are the most prepared country. Uh, about 150,000 doses arrived in the country early, earlier, this, excuse me, earlier this year. We chose, we chose to wait. It gave us enough time to observe, study, and prepare. With His Majesty the King at the helm, providing guidance and vision, we have been successful in preventing a disaster that even the most developed countries couldn't. So uh, I'm not arguing that uh, you know, all of Bhutan's 
strategies and values were flawless or that they could be you know, transported into other places. But I, I do think that Bhutan um, offers public health lessons that, that transcend culture and uh, geography, uh, uh, or at the very least, it, it gives us food for thought. So thank you. Madeline, thank you so much. I think I probably speak for many of us here when I say that I would like to move to Bhutan now. <laughs> uh, quite wonderful to hear, you know, the ways that you describe this immense uh, integration and collaboration between religious leaders and government officials and, you know, no apparent discrepancy between, you know, scientific ways of knowing and thinking on the one hand and religious on the other and really the ability to fuse them and see them as complementary and the benefit that that has uh, for the citizenry of Bhutan. Um, that is really, it, it's an extraordinary, extraordinary, um, almost a parable in listening to you describe it. Um, I want to um, turn things over to our final speaker um, for this event, um, Mark Haywood, who brings to this discussion a lifetime of experience in human rights activism and specifically in response to the AIDS pandemic, um, which we felt from the beginning was so important um, to talk about here today. He's currently the editor of the Maverick Citizen, um, a section of the South African Daily Maverick. I read his op-ed published yesterday calling for a massive, quote, a massive decentralized campaign in the media, but also on the ground to overcome vaccine hesitancy. And I am hopeful he will say more on that topic to us today. His talk today is titled, An Activist's Perspective on Science Communications, What We Learned from the HIV AIDS Pandemic. So over to you, Mark. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, good evening from Johannesburg to all of the bitter enders who are still here uh, at this stage in this afternoon's very, very uh, interesting set of uh, presentations. Thank you too for wanting to draw parallels uh, and connections between COVID-19 and the HIV uh, epidemic, an epidemic which I think uh, should be clear, we should be clear is not a epidemic that is over. And in fact, one of the tragedies uh, that has been brought about by the COVID-19 crisis globally is that much of the ground or a significant portion of the ground that we have won in relation to HIV and tuberculosis and other diseases, including how we message and communicate on those diseases uh, is at risk of being lost. And I believe in countries like South Africa is being lost at the moment. So. I do think that when we talk about risk communication, uh, one of the first things to say, one of the first lessons, if, if, if you like, is the need to have a holistic approach to risk communication, which even whilst we recognize the immediacy and urgency of COVID-19, does not lose sight for one minute of other causes of uh, ill health and of mortality and of underdevelopment. I think it's also important that we've made this connection because although the two pandemics are very different in terms of modes of transmission, in terms of societal and political responses, in terms of the fact that after decades and decades, we still don't have a vaccine for HIV, but we have a vaccine for COVID-19, which is what we've been discussing this afternoon, that despite all of those differences, we have faced very similar problems when it comes to this question of risk communication. And although I felt very uplifted by the presentations within the, the four walls of this webinar uh, this afternoon, uh, I have often questioned whether we have learned enough from HIV and whether we have carried our learnings, particularly in the real world at the governmental level, at societal level, whether we have carried those learnings into COVID-19. Because in South Africa, for example, uh, I see a great focus on 
individual behavior change to the exclusion of community uh, uh, behavior change. Uh, you know, one of Madeline's slides uh, showed the steps to acceptance. And uh, I think the fourth uh, circle up towards the top of the slide said capacity to change. And capacity to change often depends upon creating an enabling environment which allows change after the individual has made that informed decision themselves. And I think a second factor or second set of lessons that we have to learn is how not to abstract health-seeking behavior from other risks to health and well-being. And unfortunately, to recognize that even in the context of something like COVID-19, poor people, marginalized people, criminalized people, refugees and migrants often have to balance and negotiate behavior changes in terms of what is the risk of the immediate, uh, the immediate moment. And those, I think, are the challenges that we face. And so my comments really come from two perspectives. Uh, one is uh, as a treatment access activist in the HIV epidemic, where the communication and advocacy obviously was not for a vaccine, but for access to antiretroviral uh, medicines. And then latterly as a journalist stroke activist uh, in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic of the, of the last year. And I want to speak uh, briefly to, to both of those and to try to build a bridge uh, between COVID-19 uh, or between HIV and, and, and COVID-19. And although my comments are drawn from our experience in South Africa, I do think that they have a broader uh, applicability and relevance, maybe not to Bhutan, which seems to have done uh, everything right, but certainly to many other uh, countries in, in many other developing countries and countries that I'm familiar with in uh, Africa in, and in Southern Africa. So, so just starting with, with HIV, you know, the baseline for communication uh, that we had to confront around HIV was a situation not entirely dissimilar from COVID-19. There was fear, there was stigma, there was illiteracy, and there was misinformation. Uh, in our case in South Africa, uh, active AIDS denialism, not a million miles away from the anti-vax uh, misinformation that we confront in relation to, to COVID-19. We had high rates of HIV infection. We struggled with behavior change. And like with COVID-19, as was explained uh, also by Melinda, we have had to, we had to adjust our communication strategies to the changing phases of the, of, of, of the epidemic. In the case of HIV, between the period where all of the advocacy was on prevention, all of the communication was on prevention to periods when communication was able to encompass and start to drive uh, in, in relation to access to treatment. And what did we learn uh, from that baseline? Well, I think we learned mostly by our mistakes, but I think what we taught uh, as activists, uh, and these, this has been reinforced from what I've heard today, is the importance of building communication from below. Uh, we pioneered in South Africa, at least, uh, the, the notion of HIV treatment literacy, which precisely sought to address the questions, the fears, the misunderstandings, but do so in a way which didn't dumb down science and didn't dumb down medicine, but took medicine into communities with all of its complexity, uh, but taught it in communities in a way that could be understood and could be communicated by, by communities. We worked with scientists. There isn't time to talk about it. There was some emphasis today on the importance of working with nurses and with community healthcare workers. But I think also there's sometimes an assumption that nurses and communicate community healthcare workers 
will have the knowledge necessary for communication. And that knowledge will only come from government. Our experience was that it sometimes took community activists to convey medical knowledge and medical information to healthcare workers who were marginalized uh, 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 from the system. And then finally, in relation to, to HIV, there was the importance of educating the media and then of using the media to educate society. So a relationship that didn't just stop at trying to get the media to report accurately, not to stigmatize, but having carried out that process of, of, of education, sought to enlist the media to effective, uh, uh, effective risk, risk, risk communication. And I believe that what we learned from that, looking back today in 2021, is that we have achieved high rates of adherence to antiretrovirals, which have been sustained against odds for over a decade, and which I think are proof of the pudding of this type of communication mobilization, risk communication mobilization. Now, turning to COVID-19, I think we faced a different situation, certainly in South Africa. From the very beginning, we have had a high level of political will. Uh, research reports, including the, the, the PERC report, show high or at least reportedly high levels of understanding of COVID-19 risk uh, and of acceptance of, of public health measures to reduce that risk. So the question that I struggle with, and, and if, there was, if there had been more time, would, would present is given what appears to have been a, a, a sound platform, why is it that we have had such poor observance of non-pharmaceutical interventions? And does that tell us something about the fact that risk communication also has to embrace strategies to help people navigate the socioeconomic barriers that are critical to health behavior change? Because despite the fact that South Africa might be saluted as having shown political will, having shown intent, having been prepared to take necessary and drastic measures. As I speak to you today in South Africa, and it's not often described this way, but South Africa has one of the worst COVID-19 uh, epidemics in the world. Although officially our statistics uh, are of one and a half million infections, uh, most people, most scientists believe the numbers could be 10 times that. Although our deaths are officially just over 50,000. Our excess deaths have just peaked 150,000. And the social impact of the COVID-19 epidemic in South Africa is perhaps as bad as any country in the world. And therefore, I want to finish just by saying, well, what would be the lessons that we, we would draw from this? How would we explain this dissonance between what appeared to be effective communication and the failure of that communication to translate into, in, in, into protective uh, uh, behavior change. And I would say that it's the following. It's that most communication has been from above. It is the fact that there has been little community mobilization and involvement, and therefore little community ownership of strategies, communication strategies, and otherwise around COVID-19. We have had media saturation around COVID-19, very, very different from HIV, but you have to ask questions about the quality and the form of that media, that accuracy is not enough. It has to be accuracy and accessibility. Accessibility, and I've heard this said this afternoon, means that whilst there may be a, 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 a digital media may be awash with information. Very many people do not have access to, to digital media. And there's been a reliance on coercion rather than cooperation and unfortunately very or insufficient uh, coordination. I contacted one of our communication uh, uh, experts in the course of this webinar and his response to me was, unfortunately, there are a whole lot of separate initiatives 
GCIS, that's Government Medical Research Council, Department of Health, Solidarity Fund, provincial governments, etc. Very little coordination or, or, or quality control. And I'll finish with this point, which is about my role as, as a journalist. I think that one of the things that we can point to with COVID-19 is that there have been important areas where there has been media innovation. We've seen in particular, and I guess this is probably a global train, trend different from HIV, the importance of not-for-profit media organizations, which have now become part of the commercial media working in the space of, uh, of, of health and of, of COVID-19. We've seen the use of webinars. We've seen the publication of science and scientific opinion in mainstream news and, and, and newspapers. And yet, despite all of those positives for reasons that I've tried to suggest, it has not yet been enough to give us the advantage over this epidemic, certainly in South Africa. So as we sit here today, and I'll conclude with this point, uh, 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 Wilmot pointed out, we have 61% people report vaccine acceptance. That's not bad, but it's still 39% of people uh, who have uh, significant questions. We're seeing growing evidence of fatigue in relation to non-pharmaceutical interventions. And therefore, I want to conclude by saying that everything that has been said this afternoon in this webinar is of very, very immediate relevance to a country like South Africa and to the Southern African region, because our vaccine rollout has barely started in a single country in this region. We are in the midst of a work in progress in one of the regions which will ultimately, I think, come to be seen as one of the worst affected regions in the world. And it is not too late to reinforce the approaches and the best practices and the learnings that have been the subject of today's uh, uh, webinar. So thank you very much for the inspiration and ideas that my fellow panelists have presented in the course of the last uh, three hours. Thank you very much. Mark, thank you so much for that. What I can only describe as a kind of call to arms uh, for the work that still lies ahead for us. Um, because we're over time, I want to just say a few words about this panel myself and then wrap things up. But it is, it is so striking um, to listen to your comments side by side with Madeline's in part because of the distinct contrast which, um, between your call for um, a, a bottom-up community-driven participatory approach to risk communications versus Madeline, your portrayal of a country where an extremely like regimented, top-down government-driven campaign was actually very successful. And I don't think we're looking at a contradiction here. I think we're looking at um, some a rare bit of good news, which is that there really are multiple successful ways um, to get to good vaccine uptake and you know good uh, COVID response. And perhaps the key lies in one phrase that Mark used in his remarks, which was that the emphasis has, has been and cannot be on coercion rather than cooperation. Right? I love that phrase because it seems like what Madeline, you described in talking about Bhutan was that although we had a strong central response, it was a cooperative one where citizens were engaged um, as people with agency over their own health and were drawn into collective participation. And really that that effort helped to sustain morale, um, which I think Mark's remarks really indicate um, you know, that this fatigue with compliance, and I, I would interpret as a, a kind of low morale that comes from a disconnect between various people um, responsible for um, the public health messaging. Mark, you look like you want Victoria, to say that. Victoria, I, was, I would just say that in Bhutan, there was a strong uh, pre-existing sense of interdependence in, in the culture. Yeah, thank you for that. And Mark, I don't know if you want to add anything before I turn to wrap up. I, just, I, I agree. I think that top down can embrace bottom up. You know, top down can unleash local agency. It, it really depends upon the type 
of top down. Uh, um, that I think that is the, the, the critical uh, uh, question, yes. Thank you. And I also have been, um, Mark, you commented on this as well. I feel like the theme of nurses has really been appearing at different moments throughout, of our, dis throughout our discussion today. And so I wanna take the opportunity to close us out by talking just for a moment about the early origins of today's events, which I think are not known to everyone here. Um, the original seed for this event, as Wilma alluded to, uh, was a project that he, Jennifer, and I developed specifically to better understand the role of frontline nurses in infectious disease outbreaks and to hear and record their stories of emergency response. Jennifer, who you've heard is a nurse, was one of a small team that conducted oral history interviews with nurses in Liberia and Sierra Leone who provided direct care uh, during the 2014 Ebola outbreak in West Africa. So these oral histories, um, now some years ago, offered a really vivid picture, um, to Mark's point, of the power of decentralized risk communications. From the very first moment that the nurses we interviewed in affected regions realized that an outbreak might be underway, which in every case was the first time a patient came in with possible symptoms of Ebola. The nurses were immediately engaged with the need to, first of all, get themselves trained, right? And, the, and then turn to the significance of ongoing work with communities, building trust, offering public education about infection control and prevention. Just to take one example that emerged later in the outbreak, familiar I'm sure to many of you, it was frontline Ebola nurses who realized very quickly that community burial practices were putting people at risk and spreading Ebola. And so they developed their own grassroots risk communications worked with local communities to modify funerals rather than eliminating them as some central authorities um, tried unsuccessfully to mandate. Uh, in the end, as we all know, to finish that story, um, the Ebola nurses in that outbreak did turn around the story um, despite battling an overall case mortality in excess of 40% and doing it in the context of you know, supply shortages, a weak healthcare infrastructure, and the lack of, at that time, either effective therapies or a vaccine. Uh, in the broader frame, a recent review of COVID-19 pandemic responses uh, in Egypt, Ethiopia, Kenya, Nigeria, and South Africa, launched by the WHO at the Schmidt Futures Forum that Wilmot organized this past January, documents how community health workers and nurses have emerged as the most trusted and effective risk communicators, in large part because they are part of the communities that they care for and are frequently visible, putting their lives on the line um, in the, as a routine part of their professional code. It's hard to imagine a successful risk communications program that does not draw on this expertise. So even as we've been talking today about the current challenge of supporting vaccine uptake, I think we can also be thinking for the longer term about how to institutionalize the lessons learned on the ground by nurses and community health workers. We have to see these colleagues as the best designers and implementers of risk communication strategies. I think that is another little piece um, of good news. And my friends know I always try to find the good news <laughs> that there are battle-tested strategies for effective crisis communications and vaccine uptake, and they're already known to many of the people who've spoken today, as well as to the nurses and community workers who are the majority of the healthcare workforce. Um, as we've been discussing today, building COVID literacy and vaccine uptake happens through community partnerships. All of our speakers have described a number of great models, models that I think have been demonstrated to work in supporting vaccine uptake in challenging circumstances. I hope we'll all go forward from here with these models and lessons in our mind, finding ways to implement them at country, regional, and local levels. I have to close out finally by expressing so much gratitude to all of our speakers, to the Columbia Global Centers, to Wilmot James and Jennifer Dorn for their leadership. Uh, I'm sure I speak for all of us when I say that the, the experience, commitment, and courage in the group assembled today inspires me for the work that we all need to do. Thank you everyone for sticking with us to the bitter end. As Mark said, thank you for your attention and engagement. 
take care of yourselves. We look forward to continuing these vital conversations. <laughs>